never actually tells you when it's i think it goes live way soon oh, all right <laughs> and we're live on youtube just as i said it uh thanks for joining us today we are going to talk about cannabis aphids everybody's best friend in the garden with matthew gates uh that is me peter severi and matthew welcome you there yes oh yes i didn't hear you say <laughs> welcome i'm so sorry yes Hello, I'm uh, Matthew Gates, the Integrated Pest Management Specialist, and I'm very excited to talk to you about um, cannabis communities, maybe number one or number two worst pest. Right. It, it's definitely up there. So you want to just, uh, so this is going to be kind of presentation format, correct? Sort of, yes. I definitely have an agenda that I've taken the time to sort of um, write down and articulate. Um, I did send you some captions or some uh, some pictures, a lot of which are taken from a YouTube video that I made on the cannabis aphid. And they were just so good as a teaching tool, I thought I would use them here too. So if anyone wants to see them again, they can do that on my YouTube channel for the cannabis aphid pest primer. So this is like a presentation in that vein. Got it. All right, you want to you want to jump into it? Want to drop some knowledge? Yeah, absolutely. Um, I think I'll start off by just sort of talking about the cannabis aphid uh, in a general way to sort of help people understand what it is and the context of what an aphid is um, very briefly. So, so aphids are part of a family of the um, insect order Hemiptera, which are insects that use a sucking mouth part to extract usually phloem, sometimes xylem, the fluid channels in the plant. Um, they often have a very close symbiotic relationship with bacteria and that helps them process this food. They have a lot of physiological adaptations, allow them to um, process plant defense compounds and these symbiotic organisms help too. Um, aphids, so specifically the family or the, the order aphidoidea or the family aphidi aphididae is massive. There's a ton of different kinds of aphids. And there's two main things to know about aphids, including the cannabis aphid, which is that they have what are called telescoping generations, which means that they're born pregnant and they reproduce clonal offspring. So you have this really sophisticated physiological adaptation that allows them to reproduce very quickly without the need for fertilization. And it does occur for a lot of aphid species, but somewhat rarely. And especially for other aphid pests too, this is often the case. They don't necessarily need a male um, at all. And a lot of times sort of like greenhouse, especially populations and that sort of a thing, they don't necessarily act like they would outside where there are seasons because they're protected from that. So the environment has an influence on their physiology. They'll make a bunch of asexual clones of themselves, and then something will happen with the plant, maybe the nutrition changes or it senses that it's dying, or the season changes, and they are responsive, and they start to produce uh, females that will make eggs and not clones. Then they overwinter as eggs, and then they, re they come back again, or they produce um, uh, flying forms that will go to colonize other plants and then lay eggs and then overwinter or stay in that way. So that's a very brief summary about aphids in general. And cannabis aphid is like this. Cannabis aphid uh, reproduces by telescoping generations. So it's a very, very um, sort of present pest when you get it. And it only takes one or two to get into your area to have a, a big colony kind of erupt if you're not scouting appropriately for them. Um, so that's a major way to sort of avoid them just on the onset is to scout for them. Have a scouting program, have somebody who checks the plants uh, underneath the leaves, on the stems, um, take samples, make regular samples, and uh, also you should have a plan for getting rid of them too, but I'm getting a bit ahead of myself. Um, are there any questions or comments from you sort of at this juncture? 
from me specifically no uh let me uh we can go to the youtube audience but i i just carry on and uh i will monitor the chat So where do you want to go from here? Oh, sure. So from here, I just want to iterate that the cannabis aphid was sort of first discovered in 1860 um, in Italy, or rather it wasn't first discovered, it was first documented um, by an entomologist. So there's, so we've known about this pest for a very long time, uh, like, you know, over 200 years, but despite the fact that different various groups have made use of cannabis products and hemp and that sort of a thing, they're not, um, there's not a whole lot of information about them. So some of the information that I'm going to talk about as well is um, speculative and I'll, I'll leave it at the end because um, I'm not an entomologist. Uh, I'm just an IPM specialist. And while I understand a lot of the literature, um, there's a lot of research that has to happen about the cannabis safety in particular that I'm very much looking forward to actually seeing. So for people who need help now, I wanted to talk a little bit about the hop aphid. That's a very close relative and how um, very briefly, uh, cannabis and hops are in the family Cannabaceae, the two genera that are most closely related to each other. So they diverged around 18 to 19 million years ago. And you know, so you had a, the same organism more or less, and then they split possibly into other genera, but we only have the hops and the cannabis aphid or the cannabis plant that we have now. So the hop aphid is actually very similar in that way. And so when the aphid that fed on those two plants um, diverged, so too did the aphids. And this is actually something that happens for a lot of aphids where um, plants will speciate and uh, whole families and genera will occur and the aphids that are feeding on them will closely co-evolve with them. And this is another reason why aphids are so pernicious. They're very difficult to deal with because they have co-evolved very closely with their host plant. Um, many aphids are generalists uh, and some aphids will only have one species or they'll host switch between two somewhat or totally kind of unrelated species. The hop aphid feeds on prunus species, so stone fruit as well, and it also feeds on hops, and it also um, can feed on a couple of other plants. But that's significant because they change host seasonally, so you can kind of disrupt that uh, migration pattern if you're aware of it and you can defend against it. The cannabis aphid, however, doesn't have this host switching behavior. As far as we know, it's only specialized on cannabis. And for a long time, people thought that it also infested hops. And it's understandable that people might suspect that it could because the difference between the hop aphid and the cannabis aphid might be kind of um, low because of that. They're definitely related enough that you would want to use, um, or you could possibly make some speculation uh, physiologically and like I said, I'll be saying that later, but it's an interesting thing to consider. And I wanted to make that point early on. Cannabis aphid is in a lot of parts of the US and other parts of the world. Um, just to give you some numbers or some places rather, Romania, Germany, Pakistan, India, Canada, and also the USA, um, many, many states. And there's literature that I can provide for people who want references to this too. So if you're curious about some of the information that I talk about, I'll, I'm happy to respond with that information. Um, but just to give you a heads up, if you're in the USA, you can probably find cannabis aphids in Oregon, California, Kansas, Iowa, Wisconsin, Illinois, Indiana, Virginia, Kentucky, Colorado, Minnesota, Michigan, and probably others too. So it's definitely a, a widespread colonization that's happened in the USA. It's unclear whether or not the cannabis aphid has been kind of nascent and sort of like here kind of for a while and like people just haven't really um, caught on to it. 
but I find that kind of hard to believe because I think hemp has been grown still in, in several parts, in several places for a while. And there's been underground growing as we all know. And I'd be kind of surprised if there weren't at least some hobbyists that uh, kind of made those assertions earlier. And uh, I personally am not aware of any that are like that, um, but maybe that information will come out more and more as people like search history records and that sort of a thing. A lot of it's on the, on the internet as you well know. Um, I reside in California and the CDFA recently, well, it gave the cannabis aphid a pest rating of A initially, and now it's been downgraded to um, C uh, in, in uh, intensity. And what that basically means is that the cannabis aphid was thought to be a potentially very high economic risk for cannabis agriculture. And personally, I still think it might very well be. Um, but as, they, as the government entities that assessed it uh, discovered for themselves, at least reportedly, it's not really causing a whole lot of problems. But I'm curious what the chat thinks about that. I don't really think that it's causing no problems or very little problems. I think it's a pretty extensive problem. So I'm kind of surprised. That was one of the pieces of information that I um, that I had written down earlier. And then I decided to fact check myself just to make sure that I was right about several references that I've been using in the past. And, let, and lo and behold, it's a C level instead of an A level. So I found that kind of interesting. Um, I should have probably mentioned some of the uh, pictures. I'm so sorry. Uh, I had some up here about aphids. Maybe it's a good time to um, talk about that. If you could go to the slide, are you ready? Yep. Uh, the slide with the, um, the it has a diagram with a bunch of lines. This one? This one. That's correct. So um, this just kind of is sort of a graphical representation of how the aphids, just for people who were curious, how they moved from feeding on conifer plants all the way up to uh, feeding on flowering plants and then diversifying as all of the flowering plants diversified too. So they followed that coevolution uh, pretty closely. So for people who are having trouble with aphids, you should know that like aphids have had a very long time as an insect group to co-evolve with plants. They're very, they have very sophisticated ways to defend against uh, plant defense compounds and other sorts of aspects of the immune system. Aphids also represent something close to like in some reported literature, 50% of plant virus um, uh, transference. So that's very extensive. And a lot of other hemiptera that um, feed on phloem also have this capability too. So I just wanted to bring that up as well. For people who are curious what the cannabis aphid looks like, I probably should have started at the beginning, but I have a, um, a photo that shows some morphological traits of aphids. Uh, sorry, this yes. one? Yes. So um, you can see that it has what we call a, um, a lacry. What? Sorry, uh, Matthew, I just accidentally muted you instead of me. Uh, can oh. you say that again? Can you start from the top again? What are we looking yeah. at here? Absolutely, absolutely. So the cannabis aphid has a lacrimiform bow plane, which is just fancy speak for a tear-shaped um, body plan. So it's got this like teardrop kind of shape. It's usually a pale green color, as you can see from the uh, photo here under a microscope. The thing about all the forodon gen, uh, species in the forodon genus, they have these antennal tubercles, which you can see on the upper left. And this, so this is not going to tell you necessarily by itself that a cannabis aphid or an aphid that you're seeing with these tubercles is the cannabis aphid because the hop aphid has them, other forodon genera also have them. So it's a morphological trait down to genus which is very useful. And then if you kind of, if you can recognize the sort of the body shape and um, I think I have a picture 
that I included with the adults, what the adults look like, but I can't remember. I, do, I did not. If you want to see an adult with the uh, flying, uh, with the wings, the a ladies. Do, do you want to just do you want to just text it to me and I'll show it? I. Uh, I could probably email it to you. Really sure. Yeah, yeah. yeah. We live in the future, after all. Uh, uh, sorry. So so you also had this stuff. Uh, oh right. Let me explain that too. So one thing, one aspect about their physiology is that aphids produce what's called honeydew. So they kind of work like a living tap. They put their stylet in the flow in the plant. They suck up the phloem from the sieve elements. And because of the pressure difference, it's kind of like, like trying to put a, a shunt into like a, a hose, <laughs> you know, there's a lot of pressure proportionally that's going to be um, uh, coming out of that, that sieve element. So they, they fill up on this phloem and they have like an org, uh, an intestinal tract that basically has to work like a, a mesh screen and it kind of like, um, well, I won't get into those details basically, but what happens is that they can't really take care of all of the sugars and everything and the amino acids that they wanna make. So they make these things called uh, honeydew, these little droplets and they, it's waste product, but it is dropped from uh, them and it fills up the canopy, the lower canopy of plants or on tree trunks or on whatever. Many hemiptera do this as well, that feed on plants anyways. And so this is called honeydew and we call all of these sort of secretions honeydew. But it causes, it's a substrate for a fungus called sooty mold. Sooty mold is not actually pathogenic to the plant, but it is an epiphyte. So it does um, exist on this honeydew surface and it does lower photosynthetic ability because it blocks out the, the sun obviously to the chlorophyll below. So you should get rid of it, but it's a great sign. If you see this, you're probably dealing with some colony of hemiptera very close by, usually vertically. But um, yeah, let me, let me send you this. Actually, I could probably just send you the video and maybe a screenshot. Yeah, this, the, uh, let me make sure I'm not, yeah, I'm not muted. Uh, Send send me uh, j just well yes yeah, send whatever you can. <laughs> yeah, sorry about that. Um, yeah, let me put this in the chat for you. Look at that. That's one of the reasons why I chose to use this presentation format because I knew the references would be easily available to people, even people in the chat if they wanted to like look at the pictures again. So there we go, and it's um. Just to give you a timestamp, uh, see here. Wait, I think you just sent me a link to our live video. Oh, <laughs> I was like, that's a oh list. my goodness. <laughs> Let me do this. So, yeah, for anyone else who wants to follow along, they can find the Ford on cannabis um, pest primer video on my. YouTube channel Xenthanol. Sorry about that. Yeah, and the timestamp is, let me see here. Uh, oh, here I see. All right, what, what's the timestamp or ballpark? Oh, sorry. Unfortunately, the timestamp um, is for Ford on Humuli, which looks very similar. I apologize. It's at okay. uh, four, 401, but it'll work out for morphology purposes. Uh, yeah. Okay. Well, let's keep going and I'll, I'll share this, uh, in a minute. For sure. So, so yeah, so aphids have 
most aphids at least have a, a winged form. And the winged form for cannabis aphid doesn't always come. It usually comes during the um, latter half of the season in autumn. Uh, but depending on how you're cultivating your plants, you might never see it. But if people are growing um, outside, it's more likely that they'll come across it uh, at this time, which is also important for integrated pest management um, strategy. If you know that you might deal with the cannabis aphid and you're seeing all these winged aphids, then you know that it's possible, especially if it's sort of that time of the year in the autumn um, and kind of late summer, then you might be getting an infestation from somewhere externally, most likely. It's also possible that they came in on um, infested cuttings and plant material and that sort of a thing. All right, just uh, quickly, is this what you were talking about? Yes, it was. This is the hop aphid actually, so it's the sister species. But you can see pretty well from this picture um, sort of the wings. A lot of people mistake aphids for fungus gnats um, and especially uh, rice root aphid I find, which is also a very pernicious cannabis pest, which I also have a pest primer video for. Um, if you want to compare the difference between this aphid, um, the rice root aphid, which looks different, has a different color, but they both can have wings. And if you're not familiar with sort of aphid morphology, then it might look very similar also to other winged small insects that might hang around the soil, like the rice root aphid or some other kind of fly or gnat or that kind of a thing. You can kind of see the stylet in the picture, the mouth part. Um, so they use that to pierce the tissue of um, cannabis and any other plant that they're feeding on. So I just wanted to have people, um, I wanted to give people a picture that they can sort of uh, use as reference when I'm talking about flying aphids. Um, and you can also see on that picture in the bottom right what some aphids that don't have wings kind of look like. They have this sort of uh, bulbous form. They have kind of long antenna usually. And in the case of the hop aphid, it can um, cause pseudogalls in the plant. Uh, you're, so you're, those, you're, you're, you're talking about this right down here? Yeah, those are aphids without wings. And then at the top, there's um, an example of how the hop aphid, which is the sister to the cannabis aphid, um, or, or rather a different aphid, I'm so sorry, a different aphid that shares the same host causes pseudogalls, which are these like leaf curls. Some aphids and other organisms can produce galls in plants through their phytotoxic saliva or through pathogens and that sort of a thing. And it, it creates a defense where they can hang out and not be affected by predators which is really adaptively helpful. And so what happens is that the hop aphid can feed on these uh, plum aphid um, plants or the same plant, but they can feed in the shelter and they can reproduce and then they can come back next season. So in that way, by sharing a host, they have this other additional effect, um, which is just a contextual point about the hop aphid versus the cannabis aphid. Okay, so my... <laughs> Remember, so I'm trying to remember I was saying before, like when you have multiple people, you can uh, spotlight a video and everybody sees that. And when you just pin a video, it does not do that. Uh, so nobody's seeing the slides, although I've been diligently showing them on our, in our conversation. Uh, so anyway, all right. So th th this is what you were talking about just because now people can definitely see my stuff. Um, but basically, there's the adult uh, hemp aphid, right, or hop aphid, I should say. And then this is uh, what you were talking about as well. So carry on. Yeah, sorry about that, chat. Um, definitely check out the video for the um, for the picture. It's at four at four minutes in. Or or, or or if you want, uh, I mean, they're all saying you should share your screen. Which uh, do, do you want to just share your screen? That would probably oh, be wait. Simpler, huh? So oh. Julian Kirby said, I'm 530 behind and I've seen all the slides so far. Make up your mind, people. <laughs> uh, uh, so so, so can, can, can you try to screen share? Absolutely. Uh, if you don't okay. think it, it'll disjoint the chat or the flow of the video. 
Okay, so I just gave you the ability to share your screen. Uh, yeah, we're working on showing Matthew's screen. Uh, so let Matthew, let me know when you, uh, do, do you see the screen share option? Yeah, let me, I'm trying to uh, get the right place. Uh, okay, and we'll just do that. And there I am. We'll do us next to each other. All right, you started screening. Oh my God, look at that. There you go. Clear. Is it clear? Yes. Cool. Okay. Can you see my mouse? I can. Excellent. So, all right. So here you can see the wings. You'll you'll notice that um, the aphid has these this stylet here. This is what it uses to pierce the plant. These wings are they have a particular kind of venation to them. You can also see that it has two pairs of wings. Okay. And um, there's like a larger wing and a minor wing. This is the hop aphid, not the cannabis aphid specifically. I do have observational videos of um, cannabis aphids, which look a little bit different, but they are basically, they have this sort of uh, morphology to them um, with longer sort of um, uh, antennae here. They, they all have stylets. They all have this like head, thorax, abdomen look. And they also have these things called cornicles. You can see in this, uh, um, this picture here, there are some exuviae too. Um, exuviae are the exoskeletons that they molt. So they go through many molts as nymphs and then they become adults. And then when they're adults, they can lay uh, their clonal offspring or eggs depending on the season, whatever's happening. So this colony here has a bunch of smaller nymphs. Um, and then you can see some subadults uh, that are going to become uh, winged forms because they have these wing buds here. And they, you know, you can see the antenna and the eye, and I think this might even be the stylet. Um, but see, these are wing buds, and those will eventually turn into wings. These are probably, I believe these are adults, yes, at this size. And uh, it's possible that some of these adults birth some of these nymphs in this colony. So there's a nice colony picture here for reference. And then um, can you see the Oh, I have the video on now. Uh, can you see this, the, um, the Zoom meeting? Is it recursive? What, what do you mean? Uh, I see the same, I see the adult uh, hop aphid. Oh, never mind. Um, I see. The, uh, here you can see on the right the pseudogall that I was talking about. And the, um, the plum aphid causes that, not the hop aphid. Uh, but the pseudogall allows the hop aphid to live in, in there, reproduce, not be attacked by predators and parasitoid wasps, and then um, come back next season because they have this shelter that they're appropriating from another aphid entirely. So that's one disadvantage, for example. It also vectors several viruses like hop mosaic virus, potato virus Y, and plum pox virus. Um, it's unclear what the virome, first of all, the virome of cannabis is very understudied. Um, so it's also unclear whether or not cannabis aphids can vector viruses, whether they do it naturally or they can pick up other viruses uh, in a novel way. We don't really know about that either, which is another aspect of um, entomological research that I'd really like to see a lot more of. And hopefully we'll see a lot more of in the next five years or so, five to 10 years, I'm hoping we have some good data coming up. So I will stop screen sharing now. Cool. So I'll continue. Unless you want to field questions. Uh, why, why don't we jump into some questions? Um, 
Uh, Cascadian Grown asked, uh, do we know anything about the evolution of the aphid predators alongside the evolution of the aphids and their host plants? Uh, yes, we definitely do. So um, there are there are two major groups um, for like from like a agricultural perspective, there's mostly sort of carnivorous predators that are generalists or specialists. Um, and there are parasitoids that are generalists or specialists. So parasitoids are parasites that kill their hosts as a uh, typical aspect of their parasitation, whereas a parasite typically doesn't um, sort of inherently kill its um, host, if that makes sense. So parasitoid, parasitoid wasps are wasps that uh, parasitize their host. There are hyperparasitoids also that will parasitize them. It's turtles all the way down. Uh, there's a lot of interesting interactions at various levels, but um, ecologically, there are carnivorous predators that go after aphids that have co-evolved to recognize them by sight. Uh, certain aphid species, for example, can be different colors. So for example, red or green in the peach aphid, that's controlled by a uh, bacteria that exists as a symbiont. And it turns out that P aphids that have the, um, that are red morphed, they, I believe, do not get eaten as much as the green morphs do. Um, this also occurs for parasitoids where uh, one color is going to be more attractive than another color. And they've done like studies to kind of um, see whether this is or not the case. So there's a lot of interaction from the symbionts, the symbionts, which are bacteria um, that are both either allowing them to detoxify the defense compounds and uh, plants. They might send off um, semiochemicals, so communication chemicals, volatiles, that sort of a thing. Uh, they might also depress aspects of the plant's immune system by creating or producing effectors and various other compounds that limit or in some way depress the immune system. Um, also, there are symbionts, there are symbionts that have symbionts, if you can believe it. The, and I talk about this in my um, on aphids video on my YouTube channel. I go into aphids very in depth. And this is one aspect of that. There are symbionts that can create uh, toxins that make them make the host aphid an unsuitable choice for parasitoids. And in one study, parasitoid wasps that were used against, I think it was the P aphid, um, they reduced the parasitoid um, larval development success rate by like 60%. So that those populations that had symbionts of symbionts were way more survivable in that scenario. And that's an, an, a huge evolutionary advantage. And then important thing, they're telescoping in their generations. So they produce clones of themselves and those clones also have those symbionts. So su successful clonal populations can still um, adapt in a way that kind of offsets the fact that they're asexual and that they're physiologically very similar. They can either pick up symbionts sometimes or they can lose symbionts over time. In fact, laboratory uh, cultures sometimes, well, because we know about symbionts much more now, we're kind of thinking about how uh, some laboratory cultures will lack symbionts that are found in the natural world. This is um, significant because if you're doing research on those aphids, like with predator-prey relationships or on certain plants, then if they don't have those symbionts, the research that you're making might not be totally uh, germane with reality. So that's one, I, I know that's sort of an extensive answer, but I thought it was a really good question, deserved the, the response like that. Hopefully that was helpful. Yes, we, we, like, we like long form answers and responses here. Uh, so the, um, 
There was just a quick thing. Do ladybugs hunt gnats as well as aphids? So that was P. Win. Do ladybugs hunt gnats as well as aphids? Julian Kirby said ladybugs do not hunt gnats. We require traps and soil living predators for gnats. The ladybugs won't say no to food in the form of gnats, but it's unlikely they're going to go rooting around the soil for larva. Uh, so what are your thoughts on ladybugs and uh, gnats? I agree with the response. Um, people who might not know this, though, uh, typically, we think of lady beetles that feed on aphids, particularly. And usually, now, interesting, you always call them lady beetles. Uh, I'm Are being, you just more I'm being accurate than the rest of us? I'm being pretentious. Okay, I'm sorry. Um, because uh, <laughs> because I feel like bug. I think or lady bird beetles. That's another way to say it. But um, I feel like it's more efficient. That's all. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, I was and just, maybe a little I was, bit more precise about that. bug is like hemiptera those are the bugs actually yeah. but i it's totally valid i'm not a um nazi about that kind of thing oh shit <laughs> uh so rob said can you talk about the winged root aphid and strategies to remove from indoor gardens oh could you say that one more time uh, can you talk about the winged root aphid and strategies to remove it from indoor gardens? Absolutely. Um, of course, like all advice, it will depend on where you are, what resources you have, and that sort of a thing, which are important aspects of IPM. But um, in my experience, a lot of people can get access to the entomopathogenic fungus, Bouveria bassiana, uh, at least at a commercial level. And I like to use it in drenches and dips. And depending on how you're set up, that will be easy to do or not really practical to do, but the drenches should be possible. And I find that a significantly high um, uh, sort of uh, drench level is very important. Um, both be aggressive with how much you put and aggressive in um, additional and frequency of application because the rice root aphids, because they reproduce so extensively, and a lot of the time they're protected because of the underground, there aren't a whole lot of biocontrols that go after them really. There are, I suppose, row of beetles and other sorts of predatory mites, but I haven't seen a lot of literature that really backs up their efficaciousness. Like they might feed on them in like a no choice food study, um, but to what level, you know, in a, in a complex environment, I think that's kind of hard to tell. And I've, I haven't had personal experience with that being very useful, usually. Um, but the intimate pathogenic fungus is useful because as many spores as you can get on contact, there's more likely that you'll have um, uh, death in the target. And I have a video that goes over the rice root aphid row palisite from Rufium dominale, um, another pest primer video kind of like this one, uh, where I go over Bouveri bassiana, other biocontrol agents that can affect the um, super terranean amount uh, populations, the ones on the plants. Um, and then you can use the Bouveri bassiana um, in the soil or whatever substrate that you're using. So <laughs> Stumu said, I sprinkle uh, diatomaceous earth on anything that moves works well. And then Julian responded, I've been feeding my garden too well. The pests don't respond to DE anymore. The ants actively make tunnels through it. That's an interesting observation. Um, so in my experience, diatomaceous earth isn't very effective, but it depends on how you apply it, I suppose. And if you have a small enough colony, the thing that I find is difficult is that the diatomaceous earth will hydrate <laughs> really easily because it's made up of, uh, you know, silicate fragments from um, uh, marine arthro uh, not arthropods, but uh, marine microbes, diatoms, right? Diatomaceous earth. So. Um, if you apply DE and then you hydrate the DE, uh, I find that the DE isn't very effective afterwards. So I'd be curious to know how that's um, worked for them. I think that it, you could maybe achieve some kills off of the, a DE approach, but it might be a little bit um, application heavy and it probably won't be able to eradicate 
you have to probably use many different facets uh, in an integrated approach to have the best effect, at least. OK. Um, I'm trying to understand. Uh, what is, this is TH. Uh, what is the view on the positive defense if you're using on aphids? If you use biocontrol like Grandivo, Venerate, Botanigard. So can you talk about, I guess we're talking about the Marone product line here. Uh, what are your thoughts? I have seen, um, I've seen some effect, but I've never personally, I've never worked with anyone who was able to achieve um, a higher level of effect against rice root aphids uh, or cannabis aphids for that matter um, with the BioLine pro or the, the Marone products for that um, particular species. Um, that doesn't mean that it's not possible, I suppose, but in my experience, I haven't, I haven't had that um, effect but I have seen some effect. So in a, again, sort of an integrated system, I think that it's not invalid to utilize, but I think that maybe I'm not able to use it appropriately, I don't know, but it seems to not be as efficacious as I'd hope that it would be, especially for um, maybe the cost of the product or um, the cost and labor to apply it. Um could go in a lot of directions here. Uh, all right, wait, I, I'm going to group all these uh, wedding. Oh, so, so, so let's go to, <laughs> to neem oil. Uh, what are your thoughts on neem oil? Um, neem oil is an insecticide. It is mainly as a directin. There are other compounds that can be in neem oil or neem products, some of which are not inherent to the neem tree, like adulterants or pesticides that might be applied to the plant and then accumulate through the extraction process. So that's something to watch out for. Um, Azadiractin and the related compounds in neem products are also, they also can have an antimicrobial effect. Um, in some research, I've seen that they can have some antimicrobial effect, but again, translating to a field situation and the complexity of that, I don't really know how antimicrobial it will really be. It's kind of hard to judge that. But um, azadiractin is an effective insecticide. Um, it's a neurotoxin. Uh, and that's the way that it works on the insect and other some other arthropod physiology too. As far as like using it, some places um, it's not allowed and in other places it's allowed, but I would not, I would recommend against using it in flour because I don't think that it's a great thing to um, potentially have residue for. And although it's a contentious subject, I generally feel that way about a lot of different things in cannabis and not necessarily just as a direct and just as a, as a means of like quality control. Um, yeah, but from like a home grow perspective or from a commercial perspective even, I think it's an effective um, insecticidal agent for a lot of different insects and arthropods. Got it. Uh, yeah, we may come back to neem. We got we got Clackamas Coot who said neem oil for the win. Um, so so let's uh, emulsifiers. Uh, Castile soap is a great, that's Cascadian grown. Castile soap is a great emulsifier. Um, I'm going to answer Martin Kimberly. Are wood lice a problem for plants? Not typically, no. Oh yeah, you can read the chat too. <laughs> you can pick questions. Uh, <laughs> well, I appreciate your help, man. Ah, all right, so Spartan grown. Uh, can you please ask Matthew if he views neem meal as a soil amendment of positive for IPM? Uh, definitely, it can be. It obviously it depends on your. And so, like in Spartan's case, you know, shout out to Spartan Grown, shout out to Clackamas Coot. Um, recently made more and more of an acquaintance with him, and I'm appreciating the interactions greatly. Um, but so, like, if somebody is trying to have a certain or cultivate a certain kind of soil microbiome, then ostensibly neem oil may have a negative effect on some of those microbes. 
And unfortunately, the, the most intellectually honest answer I can give you is that we don't really know to what extent that would be. Um, I saw somebody mention in the comments the sort of um, photoreactivity of azadiractin. They said that the sun might break it down. And while that might be true, it still might be able to do some sort of damage. And in a meal form, it might last longer, have a longer residual. It's not just azadiractin. There are other compounds um, that, can, that can have various other effects. And so it's a cocktail. It's really a cocktail of different compounds rather than just as directin, but it's mainly as a directin that people are thinking of with neem products. Mm -hmm. So I would, sh in the short answer, yes, definitely. Um, but well, you should be aware of that particular, you know, facet. Let, let, let's take two different case studies. One would be someone who already has a healthy aphid population. And then the other one would be, they don't have the aphids yet and you want to be preventative because you know, they're probably coming. So like if, if you walk onto a farm and you're noticing a lot of, I mean, obviously it's one solution is to kill the whole crop and start over. But if you're going to salvage, it's, you know, annoying, but still relatively under control. What's kind of like, are you first starting by spraying and trying to kill the living uh, aphids and then, um, you know, maybe making sure that the plants have enough uh, available nutrients and brand, and then introducing the predator bugs or what, what's your, I mean, obviously every, every situation is unique, but generally what's the, the one, two, three punch of, of combating the aphids. So generally speaking, um, so comprehensively, hopefully you have, I'll start with what you do when you don't have aphids and how you sort of prevent that. Um, with the cannabis aphid in particular, you want to have already just as a basic thing, you want to be scouting. If you're, if it's a home grow situation, then you want to be checking your plants either every day or at least every week, uh, depending on how many plants you are, that's going to differ in how much time you can afford, which is why I like to say that it's good to just do like a sample, like make sure you do a certain percentage of plants, maybe randomly every week. If it's just four plants, that's really easy. If it's like 20, or 12 or whatever, then it's going to be more. Same in the commercial situation where it's much more important to take random samples and that sort of a thing. And so hopefully you would find a colony sort of in an isolated space and that hopefully you would be detecting multiple populations um, at the onset. And so at that point, you would be able to apply an aggressive approach and get rid of the populations quickly. If you, um, I mean, one, one option is that you can simply cut the material if you think there's only very little. Um, if, you, if you do like a more intensive scouting and you follow up and you don't really find any other areas with the cannabis aphid, which unlike the rice root aphid, um, it doesn't have a hypogeal or subterranean uh, lifestyle. So it's only gonna be on the plant, on the uh, green parts of the plant. If you can cut that, material away, that might just be the easiest thing to do. It's very low labor. Um, it's very low stress. Um, and you don't even have to apply a product. So in that way, you're kind of being frugal, right? If you find that, in fact, you have a much more serious problem and that uh, cutting in that way is not going to alleviate the problem sort of very easily, very quickly, or you don't have the time for whatever reason, and you're still in a vegetative state, um, there are many uh, pesticidal uh, compounds that are available. Um, it depends on where you are, of course, but I like to use Bavaria Bassiana. I also like to use various horticultural oils. Um, many people suggest Safoil X, for example, um, to apply, and I've had um, great effect with that as well. Um, Azadiractin is an insecticide that would work. Um, I'm a little bit... <laughs> Oh, what <laughs> is there a question? No, no, no. Look, look who just joined us. What's up, everybody? I'm Spartan Grown. <laughs> oh, right. it has the. Uh, it was highlighted. Hey, whoa! <laughs> I like so, it. So, so carry on. You're dropping knowledge. 
Yeah, so, and Spartan, uh, feel free to jump in if you have some uh, experience, because I, I know people appreciate uh, having various people's experiences. Um, tell, tell, tell us about those Michigan aphids. Yeah, seriously. I honestly don't see a lot of aphids in my gardens here. I, I've honestly never had to really deal with them here. I think, I don't know, I'm sure the aphids happen, and I've seen them outside. Like, I've seen them on my plants outside, but not... Uh, not my cannabis plants. They tend to uh, be, I just look for ants. If I look for, if I'm looking for an outdoor area, I look for an outdoor area where I can see zero ant hills. That's my, my pro tip as far as avoiding aphids in Michigan. If you stay away from the ants, you tend to stay away from the aphids, stay away from trees, overhanging things like that. If you're in a pretty much wide open area with good airflow, I mean, I've done five years straight with no aphids, so I don't know. I don't, I just don't see them in my area. Well, well, and, and is that because the ants can be an indicator of aphids because they're mining the aphids for, uh, their nectar? For yeah, the they actually pick yeah. them up and move them around. I've, I've actually shot video on my, uh, it was a burdock that this giant, beautiful burdock that was grown on its own in one of my flower beds. And, uh, yeah, those big black, uh, I don't know if they're carpenter ants, but, uh, big black ants. And I could actually sit there, watch them pick them up and move them to different parts of the plant. Yeah, I just want to jump in here and say, yeah, they probably were carpenter ants. That's true. And then it's it's an aspect of the uh, ecology from that question previously that I probably could have mentioned it as well. Uh, a lot of ants, not all, but a lot of ants will uh, feed on the honeydew exudate, that sugary substance, not just that fungus, that city mold, but also ants. Some ants will husband the aphids. They'll take the aphids and they'll remove them from a plant and move them. But not all ants that feed on the honeydew do this. Um, at the, but at the very least, they can guard it. They, it's called um, guard recruitment in ecology. And so what happens is that the ants will feed on the honeydew and they'll protect the aphids at the very least, uh, potentially. Or even if they're not doing it um, uh, very attentively, they might just by way of being on the plant uh, attack other sorts of insects that don't produce honeydew. Um, and some of those might be predators or they'll at least chase them away. So for the cannabis grower, this is possibly a net negative, but in the ecological environment, sometimes that's a net positive because they might chase off more damaging pests and that sort of a thing. Um, it's kind of funny how that sort of a thing works sometimes. Matthew, enough with the softball questions. I, I'm bringing in the flamethrower. <laughs> I think that's also a valid technique. I think that would be a physical control. You're killing. I was just going to say, physical. funny enough, that's my favorite IPM technique, or not IPM. That's pest control technique, flamethrower. What model do you use? I forget. What's that? Is there a model that you're? That oh, not anything. I, I mean, if. If they make them for weeds, they call them weeders or something. It's just a little torch. But uh, if you don't have that, any a, d a dab torch will work. Uh, yeah. You know, any amount of flame will do the job. You might have to put a little bit of gas on it, but it'll work eventually. You know, uh, it's it's definitely the case uh, on various agricultural we countries. Farmers. Oh, Clackamas Coot. Hello. How are you? Good. How are you guys doing? Doing great to great. see you, Joe. Can I demystify Nemo once and for all? Okay. Please do. Probably you know not, honestly. Okay. See this? This book, the author spent 36 years researching it. And when he started, he had a PhD. So this wasn't Loving Hands uh, Horticulture, right? This was University of Cologne. 1958, he finished his studies in 1993. Okay, for example, I'll bet you not many cannabis growers know that there's 65 forms of just azadiractin. Besides azadiractin, there's like four or five forms of nimbin. The way that neem oil works is this. Some of the compounds prohibit the larva from developing. That's a good thing. Some of them prevent the larva from even eating. They regurgitate what they ate. The reason that one company in America is named the Ahimsa Foundation is because Ahimsa is a Hindu thing of not causing 
harm to another organism on this planet. And so you can drink as a drug. I wouldn't recommend it, but it's not gonna kill you. There's, it's not a poison. If you go if into if an it Indian- it kills things, it's a, it's a poison though. What? It's definitely, it's definitely a poison. No, sorry. I mean, if it kills things, it's poisonous in that way. It's a chemical agent. But you're saying it's not lethally poisonous to people? No. Well, if, you went into an, if you went into an Indian store, a market, we have quite a few because of Intel and uh, Nike, you would find that almost every haba, a, a health and beauty aid, contains neem oil. Over 71% of all the Ayurvedic preparations, which you could correlate that to TCM, traditional Chinese medicine, but in the Indian Ayurvedic and the other one that applies to the Jains, and I don't remember, I apologize, but over 71% of the preparations have some form of the neem, the root, the bark, the leaf, the oil, the kernel, the meal, see what I'm saying? This is, goes, you have 5,000 years of history we can look at. Like I said, I mean, I've had a drink, I didn't like it, but it was a carbonated drink with neem oil, a beverage, you know, something that you, if you're Indian, I suppose you would enjoy it or something, if you had you know, had it in your, in your uh, youth. But for you and I, you're going to be vomiting. I uh, Kind of like, kind of like me, with me and, uh, I don't know, just some food. It may, may not be pleasant, but that doesn't translate into being poisoned. Well, what I mean is that it's poisonous to the things that's poisonous to. That's the articulation I mean. So that does make it a poison, just not poisonous to people, maybe, or to a certain extent. The dose makes the poison, really. Well, yeah, that's okay. anything. Even water. Even water, I guess, supposedly would kill you. In a, in the well, right well I, I guess the main question is, does it kill? What, what's its effect on microbial populations, right? Okay, that no, was that started was my... by a guy by the name of Scotty Granola who uh, got a uh, shake and bake degree from uh, Elaine Ingham, and now he's running around claiming that uh, neem destroys microbes. That's pretty, I've been using neem for over 14 years. I don't think my soil, if you look at my plants, have suffered any. Um, now, as a matter of fact, I, I'll, re I'll find it and send it to you, Peter. In one study, it was interesting because it was done by a cannabis person. And what they found is that in these teas, these, uh, what do you call them, compost teas, whatever, ACTs, whatever, um, by adding neem meal, they increased the fungal colonies, the ones you want to see, and at the same time, suppressing the pathogenic. I don't know why that is so confusing to people. I mean, there's a lot of things on this planet that create something that we want. Okay, bacteria is responsible for cheese, right? But that doesn't mean if you eat cheese, you're going to die because it's bacteria. Yes, yeah, some bacteria causes gangrene. Some bacteria causes a lot of things. But that doesn't mean that every bacteria on this planet, otherwise, why would we use lactobacillus? Right? Yeah, I think, I think we're the big... Uh differences that people aren't looking at and actually Matthew brought this up uh, earlier when you were talking about the oil is um, source matters um, I think that when, when they do these when they do these studies I don't think they're really getting the good organic sourced neem like for example Jeremy at Builder Soil he, he does his homework and gets that stuff tested and makes sure that you're getting the clean product that hasn't been sprayed with pesticides or, or whatever else so um, and Absolutely. I think, and Absolutely. I think the difference between oil and meal is a huge difference because oil is almost like a concentrate, where the meal is just like an organic leftover, uh, almost like a waste product that you're. Uh, you're okay. Using. okay, the uh, product that uh, Jeremy's selling and the one I've been recommending for about 14 years comes out of uh, a company in uh, Minnesota called uh, the Neem Resource. They're also known as the Ahimsa Foundation. That's a cold pressed oil, a cold pressed oil, not unlike olive oil. As a matter of fact, if you look at the neem 
berry, whatever you want to call it, and an olive, they're almost, in the leaves, you'd be stunned. Okay, in the case of the olive, we're using the husk, right? But in the case of the neem, we use the kernel for the oil. And the oil, when you press the oil out of those kernels, you have eight to 10 percent. God, I hate using this word in this discussion, residue. So that's where your benefit comes in when you add the neem to the soil or to your worm bins. I highly recommend that one. Okay. I just started so, doing that too. <laughs> and and or, barley. Right. And when we do that, then when our castings are done, we have a high profile of insect suppression. As a matter of fact, one of the guests that Peter's going to have on his program next week, Dr. Yasmin Cardoza, her uh, big discovery was that we've known for years that uh, vermicompost correctly made is extremely effective at suppressing pathogenic fungi. We've known that. What she proved about five years ago is that, guess what? It's also effective at insect suppression. How cool is that? So again, we're back to by supporting the plant. The plant has a lot of capabilities at defending itself without human intervention. I'm not claiming that you should run a big farm without any IPM, I'm not claiming that at all. What I am claiming is that these methods go back thousands of years, a lot longer than this uh, cannabis scene. And um, I tend to stick, why would, uh, in the 1990s, one of the biggest corporations in America spent 800 million, when 800 million was a lot of money trying to overtake, trying to take over the Indian neem industry. Why would they do that? And the case went all the way to The Hague, this uh, international court at The Hague. Why would they do that? I'll tell you why, because they knew how effective it was and they wanted to control it. I see. In the Journal of Soil Science and Plant Nutrition, produced 2015, there's a research report called The Effects of Neem Extract and Azadiractin on Soil Microorganisms. And um, in the abstract, for people who want to check it out, um, this was the reference that I was using to say what I was saying. Um, they're exploring a particular, so when I said antimicrobial, I was very careful to point out that to what extent, right? Because, you know, fungus, water mold, bacteria, there's a bunch of different microbes out there. And there's not really research that goes over all of that. But in this particular research, they're looking at growth promoting rhizobacteria. And what they found, and we can go through the methods if we want to, the methods and materials section, but they found that applying it to the soil reduced um, uh, pectobacterium uh, carotivorum, for example. This is just in the abstract. Uh, well, that was resistant to azadiractin, I'm sorry. It was the rhizobium that was more um, affected. And so like, again, like maybe it's minimally antimicrobial, right? Like you can't really say such a general broad, you know, statement when you don't necessarily know all of the different facets. And we might find that some new microbe that we uh, develop or find in the, in the wild that we want to use commercially, maybe it is more susceptible for some reason or another. That's all I'm saying. I agree with that. I just think um, that if that was the only drawback to the product, then, you know, with in my system, in my uh, organic grow, I'm adding so much, you know, life with just the worm casting component alone that I'm sure I could, I could afford to lose some, some uh, microbes if I can get that IPM aspect. Plus there's a NPK to it. I mean, I mean, it is a, uh, or an organic input that you're adding to your soil. So, I mean, it brings in some nitrogen. That's probably the biggest contributor. What, yeah, that, that's what I was going to ask. What's it? So it's high in nitrogen. I believe the neem cake that I got from build a soil was a five one one maybe. So, I mean, it's still not huge numbers, but I mean, 
it is there is some nitrogen in there. Jim, you're muted. Okay, so let's let's look at it this way then. The argument if it, if one is going to use NPK as a an I um a standard, all right, then we'd have to say, well, you don't want to use kelp meal because it's only a, what a three one one. Oh, well, let's knock out alfalfa meal, okay, because it's only and it, see what I'm saying. So we're back to what blood meal because it's twenty five one one or, I mean, you know, I wasn't but, saying it as a bad thing. Oh, not you. It's no, 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 no. It's, it's no, like I'm, a bonus. You're getting some. You're getting some nitrogen on top of IPM. <laughs> oh, I'm sorry, hey, Spartan. You misunderstood me. That whole thing about in terms of an NPK is what I was trying to say. Okay, neem tree, like any other good tree, is an accumulator. So when we look at the neem meal from the berry, the seed, whatever, it's a full spectrum, just like kelp, 83 elements. But I wouldn't ever make the argument that, well, because uh, say blood meal has 25 whatever it is, 25-1-1, somehow that's a better fertilizer because it has a higher nitrogen number. What you could say is that it has a higher nitrogen number. We're going to talk about nitrification. We're going to hold that nitrogen in the soil. How are we going to do that? See, those are, I mean, that seems to me to be a broader art, uh, discussion than to isolate the NPK of this or that material it seems to me that okay here's a better one let's say we take worm castings and let's say we really do it right we do everything perfect textbook when we get done we're not going to have a big npk in fact the npk person look at it and just it laugh i can do better with steer manure from uh, walmart so see what i'm going with this it just yeah, MPK yeah. doesn't really tell us a whole hell of a lot. No, <laughs> it would be nice if they would tell us exactly everything, you know, but yeah. Right. It seems to me that, you know, let's look at the compound. Okay, look up as a direct in on Wikipedia and just look at that molecular structure. Where the thing came in about as a direct in is that F the FDA about three or four years ago went after Azimax and Azitrol. And I don't remember which one's which. One's uh, that advanced nutrients guy up there in Canada. And the other one is uh, General Hydroponics, I believe. I believe that was the... And so those two products are extracts and they're extracted with solvents. Well, yeah, I don't need to have an investigation to tell you you're gonna have residues on your plant if you're using as a direct and extracts, but that has nothing to do with neem oil. Um, you could say the same thing about cannabis, that if you make a, a, a really powerful extract like RSO, okay, that this amount will really cause you some kind of a physical or maybe a, a, a mental reaction, okay? I don't know that, I'm just saying, let's say that's the case, but that doesn't mean that the guy that twists up a doobie and takes a couple of hits is the same thing as taking, you know, a half ounce of RSO. No, a half ounce of RSO will make you go to sleep very fast and for right. very long. <laughs> right, exactly. But I'm saying the same thing about over here that when you talk about an extract, especially when done with uh, solvents, especially what would you expect to happen? And who would trust Mike Amaranthus in advanced nutrients? And that thing too is is like their source material. If they're using where they didn't have good growing, just, just, just for the record, I, I would. Well, wait, no, no, no. Mike, Mike Amaranthus is the uh, Mike is the fungi uh, researcher. You're talking no, about it, you're, you're, you're talking about Big Mike from Advanced Nutrients. Yeah, right. Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah. And, and yeah let's not get let's not be slanderous here. No libel, please. Uh, do you think I could continue with my presentation? Absolutely. You got you got the peanut gallery heckling you, but uh, we know you can we know you can stay the course. Go for it.
Yeah, but I would like to let Coot finish his um, thought, though. Oh, no, I guess what I want to say is that, yeah, I, you know, when we look at products, that never hit the scene. Okay, this is an extract from a cannabis company or a cannabis uh, supplier, if you will. General Hydroponics, I mean, come on. Uh, advanced Nutrients, come on. And so now that the, the uh, meme is that, oh, well, neem oil will kill you. Neem oil will kill your plants. Neem oil is going to disrupt your microbial. Uh, you know, like I said, I, I have uh, documentation from people that spent over 38 years studying. I just don't, I don't understand what this, uh, anyway, that's it. Yeah. Uh, I recommend neem. I always will. Nothing's going to dissuade me. Uh, like I said, I got 14 years. Um, that's it. And I'll just I'll put in that you've convinced me after listening to you, you've convinced me to try it. So I'm going to try it. I'm not doing the oil to sprays, but I am doing the neem meal. So I'm start. I'm, I'm dipping my toes into neem. I'll, I'll do the neem. I think it's sometimes called neem cake too, but I think the stuff that I ordered was from build a soil. That's an American thing. Okay. Everywhere okay. in the world we refer to when you, every seed, when you press the oil out of it, there's a residue. You can call it a cake. But in this country, we call it a meal. I don't get it either. So uh, if if the package came from England or India, it would probably have the name cake on it. But if it were, came into America for the American market, because it's all processed in Mumbai. And so there they would put the name on the bag. But that has to do with the contract with the end user uh, not end not user, but the end distributor in America. So that's the only uh, seed that doesn't apply to is alfalfa. Can you imagine trying to press oil out of alfalfa seeds? Okay, so anyway, that's it. And I didn't mean to interrupt. I just, uh, I think the neem, because of its religious uh, component in Hindu and Buddhism and Jains, it's got 5,000 years history. It's been used in agriculture. I don't have never read of Indians falling over dead uh, from drinking or using neem on, in their shampoos, their skin, toothpaste. But but I, I guess my question would be: Do Indian farmers use it? Absolutely. Uh, okay. They use it. Yeah, it goes back to the, it. Kind of like if you're familiar with uh, the One Straw Revolution. First, and yeah, I'm, I'm familiar okay. with um, their use of as a direct and as like an insecticide for like a very long time. Neem, you know, as like a dust, you know. Oh, you, absolutely, yeah, yeah. yeah. So you yeah, know, it's, that uh, way, it's like a, it's a, yeah. I guess and, we're, um, I guess, I guess that where I, you and I, you know, part is on definition. A poison, iodine is a poison. If I drink iodine, I'm going to fall over dead. But if I drink neem, I'm not. I might get sick. It would be like eating a Denny's or something. Yeah. You know. um, so when we look at the culture, that's to me is important to look at the, the historical culture of a material. And so when I look at neem and the long history, going back to the uh, Vedic, the pre-Vedic period. You know that's a long time, and we have a lot of we have a lot of academic work out of Pakistan and India, but that you know doesn't seem to matter with uh, some of the uh, detractors. I'll just leave it at that. You know, it's not based on science. That's all I'm saying. All right. So with that, Matthew, we will let you carry on, and then we'll open it back up to uh, the group conversation. Cool. Um, I really appreciate the insight. Um, thanks a lot. Spartan, you still here? I am. I'm still here. So, um, Guns are starting to smoke, so take it away. <laughs> so, okay. I think I have here... Oh, okay. So why don't I just hop into some of the things. So the thing about the cannabis aphid that like Coot says, in some cases, you don't have a lot of research about something. And in the cannabis aphids case, we don't really have a lot of research on it. We're kind of in the, the initial stages of giving it um, 
the focus that it needs, especially with the technology that we have now. Remember, it was documented in 1860, but it's been it's been around for like millions of years, so ostensibly at least. So um, we don't have a ton of research, but we have a lot of research on the hop aphid, which is closely related. So I wanted to bring up some speculative things about the cannabis aphid that. Um, might be useful for people who are trying to use the bleeding edge or cutting edge things that are available to them as far as information goes. It's possible that these things are relevant. I'm trying to be uh, not too generous and I'm, and I'm going to justify what I'm saying uh, with the research and understanding that hop aphid and cannabis aphid are very closely related, very closely related. And the cannabis genus and the humulus genus are also very closely related, the most closely related of those two with regards to the other uh, cannabaceae uh, in the family. So for example, um, uh, methyl salicylate, epsilon 2 hexanol, these are chemical compounds, uh, and beta caryophyllene attract hop aphids in some research. Um, and so this might be the case for uh, just just quickly is this in one of your slides oh that's a good question let me check because i can actually now that we have more than two people one of the things i can now do is spotlight video just like that oh my god can you all see that amazing chart i can see it looks good I don't think I sent it to you, but I can screen okay. share my video. You there, Matthew? Yeah, I'm there. Um, this yep. is the, can you see the? Um... Yep, yep. Okay, so in this slide, uh, it talks, so this is a, this is a research report that talks about, um, hopefully you can see it. Hopefully my mouse um, will go away and we can see the whole picture. I don't know if that'll happen, but uh, this report talked about various compounds that were um, either repellent or attractive to the hop aphid. And I've highlighted here that um, uh, epsilon muralene uh, germacrine D up in the top here, this top um, uh, highlighted space, uh, those were associated with the R or resistance genotypes in the hops plants that they were testing. So in other words, um, there was a group of plants that were considered resistant to the hop aphid and a group of plants that were considered susceptible to the hop aphid. And the ones that had, that were in the R resistant group had a lot of these compounds and these compounds were tested for their attractiveness or rather for their effects on the hop aphid. Um, we have heard of alpha and, and beta pyanine. Um, they said they see here that uh, another researcher recognized that there are three markers correlating with hop resistance to aphids and the two compounds that were positively annotated were alpha and beta pinene, which is found in cannabis. Am I wrong, Spartan? <laughs> oh, you're muted. Sorry, I was muted. Um, I was double muted there. Um, <laughs> no, you're not wrong. And pinene is actually becoming more popular. I think that's gonna be, I keep hearing more and more people, breeders, people I know looking for that particular terpene. It's the old school pine like smell and flavor. And then I'll just read here though, um, I use red to indicate that this is a negative thing and I tend to do this in my videos, though I don't always explain it. Um, green is usually positive, uh, red is usually negative, um, and yellow might just be a fun fact. Uh, lupulon and lupulin-like compounds that seem to drive the separation of the VS or the susceptible genotypes. Um, a high, this, I don't think this is going to be a problem in cannabis. I don't think they have beta acids, but I might be totally off base here. But it looks like beta acids um, were an indicator of susceptibility in, in hops, for example. So there are other things they were testing that didn't really relate to cannabis specifically. Although, but is, is this saying that 
a cultivar could be actually resistant to a pest just from terpene production? Per yes, essentially there could be, well, so these were markers and due to the fact that we know that a lot of these compounds have these effects, there's an implication that it will be these compounds in specific, especially when they tested those ones, like in this one, but it can also just, it can also be a marker of other things. And usually it's a collection of actual things that are happening uh, to repel. They might. Um, but is it in the right, like, for example, like when they test that um, it does repel in like a laboratory setting, but do they test the actual levels? Like, yeah, this, do we know that these cultivars can actually produce enough volume of these terpenes to be that effective on, a, on an insect? Is what I guess is the is the real world question there. Yeah, in some cases, and I don't remember exactly if that was the case for this specific study. But you can see in these graphs, for example, down here with the uh, germacrine D and the epsilon mur. Oh, well, this is a different compound, or they've changed it a little bit here. But you can see how um, the aphids were uh, compared to the control, at least. Um, they were not. They were not as. Uh, uh, they were not on it as much. I think is what they're showing here. This is like a. Do I have the figure here? No, I don't, unfortunately. But um, yeah, these highlighted bars are showing uh, a positive correlation, and I think down here we have the various cultivars that they were showing on hops. I don't know if you can see that in the video, here. Oh, uh, I can. Yeah, I can just see initials. It looks like. Yeah, and they and they looked at a whole bunch of other compounds too, many, many, many other compounds, some of which they didn't they didn't even have the ability to recognize or they didn't put the effort into doing so. Um, so they chose they looked at quite a bit of different compounds, and some of these are more relevant, and some of them are less relevant. So I just wanted to make that point. It's super cool, man. I, I mean, for a breeder to to have that kind of a knowledge and know that they could possibly if if they could correlate a certain terpene production, for example, the pinene or something like that, and really breed toward that to get, you know, an outdoor resistant strain towards, you know, to target an area that has, you know, aphid problems or whatever. This is a really technical thing, but it's basically a genetic heat map and they're showing like, um, uh, yeah, the metabolites detected through grass chrom uh, gas chromatography mass spectrometry. Um, and these are the genotypes of various hops. And so some of them had uh, genes that were, as we can see here in the legend, uh, very susceptible is purple, uh, susceptible is pink, intermediate resistance is blue, and resistance is green. That's another thing I want to talk about when it comes to like just generally speaking, when we talk about resistance or susceptibility. It's complex. Um, it's usually, host, uh, well, organism uh, specific. So cannabis aphid versus powdery mildew versus spider mite. For example, it might produce a compound that is uh, negative to the spider mites, but it attracts aphids, for example. A lot of times um, adaptations like that, because they're using resources and uh, machinery, genetic machinery that they already have, um, you can see a lot of overlap with other plants that might have the same or similar machinery to make the same compounds. And so you might have a conditioned response already in the environment from a biocontrol agent or, or a pest that might be really attracted to this compound that was developed to be resistant or have some sort of repellent or antifeedant effect um, against a pest, one particular pest of many potential pests. It's again, very complex, so. And that's why oftentimes you have to layer IPM strategies just to kind of be very make them very susceptible to all those things at once you know one weakens them the next one kind of cleans them up definitely right and um you know that's why it's important to use in my opinion like again a holistic integrated approach so as many advantages as you can give yourself and as many disadvantages as you can dish out to the pest um community not just one particular pest but all of them that at once as broad scale as possible without like hurting the organisms in the environment. Here's a picture of a green lacewing. Um, importantly, the larvae are the predaceous uh, life stage of this species. 
or this group actually, there's multiple green lacewing species. Um, there's also also brown lacewings, which is bottom on the bottom here. And they, the larvae and the adults, if I remember correctly, do feed on uh, aphids and possibly other insects too. So importantly, you know, green lacewings are different than brown lacewings. And um, the only other thing I have to say is that lacewings are actually pretty old as far as insects are concerned. They have a very primitive kind of body here with the gossamer wings that they can't even fold. Even beetles can fold their wings or most of them can. Um, anyways, just a little fun fact, I suppose. Here's Aureus. Um, Spartan, you use Aureus, don't you? Yes. Yep. We use those at work, man. The little, are, are they also called pirate bugs, I believe? My new pirate bugs. Yeah. They're yes. in uh, the family Anth Anthrocoridae, which means flower loving uh, or flower bug. Just yeah. quickly, how do, how do you spell Aureus? O, uh, uh, o R I U S. I love calling them pirate bugs because they just like to stab things. They don't care what people other bugs they just like to go around stabbing shit it's very true i just saw a video uh, on my instagram uh was it you or somebody else who like they had a, a picture of an aureus who had picked up an aphid and is continuing to like suck the innards out as it like walks around and maybe this was on linkedin i don't remember but uh, it was very humorous. And like he's got a slushy. He's just walking around. <laughs> taking yeah, a seriously. <laughs> it's very efficient, you know. Um, it's actually a, a, a quality of biocontrol agents. Um, it's called a type 2 response. So usually if you're eating, you can't, you can't process a meal as a, bio, as, a, as a carnivore usually and also search for food at the same time. Um, but in this case, it kind of was. So it worked out. Um, other biocontrol agents here, um, hoverfly larvae. People see these all the time and think they're caterpillars and kill them. They are not. Uh, they undulate. I think that if I let the video go, yeah. So I have a video on my YouTube channel. This is where I took this footage from. Um, but if I let the video go, yeah, that's a creepy looking thing doing the worm yeah basically right so it's understandable people would think it looks very much like a caterpillar way kind of a bummer of an adaptation i suppose um because birds will probably eat them too for the same reason um but yeah they eat aphids and they're a very very voracious um aphid predator and some people are able to attract them with uh flowers for example like alyssum um, and various other sorts of um, small floret, like so like flowers that have many different florets, um, hoverflies, which are the adult form of the of this larva. They look very much like yeah, wasps. sorry, what what's the flower that attracts the hoverfly? Alisum. A L. Uh, yeah, am I spell am I pronouncing it right? Alisum. A L Y S S U M, I think. I might have misspelled that. Oh yeah, A L Y S S U yeah. I think that's sweet, the sweet that alyssum plant plants. Isn't that in the video that the plant that it's on? Isn't that an alyssum plant? That's a fennel plant, which was also oh, highly attractive to the hoverflies because it makes like an umbel. It makes this like sort of upside down umbrella, or rather right side up umbrella um, sort of pattern with a bunch of little flowers. You've probably seen plants that kind of have this strategy for flowering, and um, uh, the hoverflies loved it. I saw it, this is from my garden. Um, there were tons of, I let the, I let aphids kind of feed on it because sometimes they get some sweet biocontrol action like right here. <laughs> I have soldier beetles too in the upper left and big eyed bugs in the bottom left, which are also predators of aphids. We've also got these whirly gig uh, mites, which I have a video about as well, the anistidae, and they are often parasites or flat out predators of aphids and other arthropods on plants. And people will see these red mites running around and they might think that they were persimilis, which is a commercially available predatory mite of spider mites. But whirligig mites move in this very, well, like a whirligig, they kind of spiral. They kind of move in sort of a spiral direction. And if you're curious about identifying them, I do have a video about them that kind of shows their movement. So you can kind of see what I'm talking about. Um, 
uh, but you know, watch that later. Uh, again, not a whole lot of solid recent uh, foot, uh, literature on the cannabis aphid and its biocontrol agents, but um, it was interesting to note that um, Aphidius metricarii was uh, recorded in Punjab feeding or parasitizing cannabis aphids specifically. So it's kind of a neat um, like example of like natural literature, ecological literature, giving us this insight into a potential biocontrol agent. Now, this doesn't mean that it's going to be an effective biocontrol agent. Not all natural biocontrol agents are highly effective and uh, suitable for the commercialization process. Why that's important is because some generalists might only feed on a little bit, or if they have a choice, they'll prefer one kind of pest over another, or different contexts will lead them to prioritize one or another. And generally speaking, uh, when you look for a biocontrol agent that you're going to mass produce, you want it to be really environmentally tolerant, ideally. You want it to be um, very voracious, and you want it to, to feed on as many, or at least damage and kill, as many uh, targets as possible. Um, and also it's often ideal that those targets are one species and not a whole bunch of other species. Uh, and they often do research to find out so that if we introduce it into a new place, it doesn't run amok and cause a bunch of ecological problems uh, in the locals, local areas. Um, currently we're doing that for the spot lanternfly, for example. We, we found a parasitoid wasp that, uh, parasitizes the eggs, but we want to make sure it doesn't also harm uh, native species, especially ones that are really not researched very much. Um, there are some plant hoppers that are native to um, the Western United States of America, for example. So if we were to apply these parasitoids, we don't want them to uh, be eradicated. That would be bad for the local ecology. So there's a lot of work that goes into this sort of a thing for those who are looking for a quick fix, um, at least from a commercial research aspect, there's a lot of research to be done. But I'm uh, happy to report that there, you can at least attract some biocontrol agents that can have some effect. And in a lot of cases, they can have quite a bit of effect, especially if they affect, or rather, if you have like a smaller population that colonizes and you have a big generalist biocontrol agent population that you've attracted, then they can wipe out small incursions before they become large. That's the best uh, way to do that in my opinion any questions from the chat i think in the commercial setting the best or at least our go-to if if we were worried about aphids would just be like a, a bavaria bassiana treatment you know like like a batana guard or whatever it is uh, a foliar but i'm thinking as you're talking is should you also worry about anything in the set the soil level like a soil drench too or is that not really a thing? Because the aphids are pretty much on the plants and they don't really go to the soil often. You know, it's cool that you mentioned that. I think that we've talked before a little bit about this, but um, soil microbiology can definitely affect the phylosphere, all the upper part of the plant, the leaves and the stems and all that, and the physiology of the plant. And they can even affect pests too. But to be honest, it's kind of hard to quantify that a lot of the time because a lot of that research is sort of, um, again, initial. It's in its initial stages and having like a comprehensive quantified answer, I think is still kind of on the horizon. But we're seeing examples of like Bouveria bassiana, which I love to talk about, that is also an endophyte as well as a soil um, microbe. So for a lot of plants, it can enter into the plant through the roots or the stem or the leaves even. It can enter into the plant and systemically colonize the plant. And um, in a telling way, literature about endophytes uh, used to use terminology like um, uh, parasitize, not parasitize, that's not right. Um, well, they would essentially use terminology that today is only really applied to parasites specifically. That's why I'm careful to use the word colonize because um, it's hard to call an organism neutral. I do use that term on occasion, uh, but beneficial versus neutral versus parasite can be actually sort of um, hard to parse. And there's been cases where we find that 
something is beneficial um, and it has a lot of beneficial effects, maybe it's a chemical compound, maybe it's a biocontrol agent, but then we find that it has some sort of side effects that could be really negative for some plants or other sorts of scenarios or not. Like maybe it makes a plant um, not tolerate the sun very well, or maybe it makes the plant very prone to um, uh, problems with like high saline soil, or maybe it makes the plant susceptible to wilting or a particular pathogen. There's even something called mycorrhizal induced susceptibility when mycorrhizae actually make certain plants susceptible to viral pathogens. So, you know, it's a very complex ecological environment and it's not just as easy as saying apply one thing or apply another thing um, in all cases at least. So I've got a question for you that it would be selfish for me to ask, but I, I'm going to ask it in a minute. But first I did see a question earlier from the chat and it was the America one was asking, was there any um, efficacy or it, to the, all these products that you sound to supposedly repel pests or, or, or keep them away? Like the, the stuff supposedly making different wavelengths of sound or whatever to uh, repel them. I like that question. Um, I am not versed in that technology. I think that, so to give you a real world, I think I actually have some research about it and I'd love to share it, but I'll share it later because I don't want to search for it. But for example, there are some insects that communicate like leaf hoppers, which are also related to aphids, leaf hoppers and other sharpshooters, they communicate through uh, vibrations. They vibrate the plant and they communicate in that way. And we're not sure like how much, like how precise this communication is, but you can apply, you could potentially apply um, like vibrations to the plants to disrupt their ability to understand each other. And in a lot of cases, leaf hoppers and plant hoppers and other sorts of uh, hemiptera like those, they use this communication to, for reproduction to identify each other and to communicate. So you could disrupt them reproductively by applying this sort of vibration potentially over a span of a few hours or months, or maybe you do it for one season or something like this. Well, isn't this kind of like radar to whales in the ocean? It's very much like that. It's essentially you're um, interfering with their ability to communicate over their medium. Exactly. So novel things like that, you know, that's some bleeding edge technology, some bleeding edge like research. Um, I'm very okay, excited to see. Me. That takes me to my next question. It's kind of like another weird thing that we're trialing at work right now. And it's called the, I believe the product is called Trioxy Complete. And it's still beyond my understanding some. I'm not sure if it's ionization or how it's working, but it essentially is um, fusing ozone into water. And then you can spray that water. Uh, we were using it as a cleaning you know, you can mop the floors with it. You could clean the tables with it. It oxidizes everything. So you don't have to worry about, you know, bacteria and, and things like that. We've recently been contacted by the company and asked to trial spraying plants with it. So we originally did some, we sprayed some plants in veg and they look great and we're going to do it again. I'm, if my understanding is right, and maybe you can help me with it. I mean, for one, is that, is the oxidation, but is that going to do anything uh, to pests, I would imagine it probably would, but I think it's mostly for like microbials, I would imagine is, is the reasoning behind spraying the plants, but is there an IPM aspect to it as well? As far as with bugs, do you think uh, ozone could uh, have any effect on, on bugs? Absolutely. Um, plants make use of oxidate, oxidation in one way or another for antimicrobial effect. And it's typically pretty broad spectrum. Um, what I mean by that is that oxidation reactions are conserved in the plant immune system, or many plant immune systems. Uh, it's a very common sort of move for plants to use this in some way, uh, in addition to other uh, effects like autolysis, like just programmed cell death and that kind of thing. 
Yeah, I've read some papers where they talk about even super oxidization is what the plant's using, like they yeah they like a nitric oxide or something. <laughs> Absolutely right, and so um, and like a lot of sterilants and um, antimicrobial products use this effect. Essentially, they are essentially trying to react with the uh, biomatter, and it's a pretty uh, solid way to do that. <laughs> it's um, you know, it, it takes, because it takes advantage of a sort of physical nature of the microbe that would be very hard for them to resist because um, it's a fundamental aspect of their nature, like their cellular membrane or their cell wall or whatever the case may be. Um, so like, yeah, so that's, that is the case in fact. And if you were to apply it on your phylosphere, like your phylosphere might have all manner and probably does have all manner of microbes on it. Even if you're trying to cultivate a particular microbiome, it's kind of hard to keep track of all of that detail and um, without doing a lot of testing. And I hope that the technology that allows us to do this more precisely and uh, at a very low cost and sort of individually, we can perhaps be able to uh, cultivate a microbiome both in the soil and in the phylosphere much better. But if you use an oxidation product like that, I could see how that could cause a problem because you might uh, be essentially killing a select population that are exposed, but you might not kill them all. That's the other thing is that if you use an antimicrobial product um, in the soil or in the phylosphere, like it might be only very minimally um, antimicrobial, or it might be only an antimicrobial to a certain selection of microbes, whereas other ones are totally unfettered. So it's, it's, um, it's but a as far as the insect prevention, is it going to help there at all? Or is that, are they more, or are they able to, um, to you know, like, it would have to be a higher concentration or something to affect an insect as far as. Yeah, usually. So, um, some sterilants can still have sort of secondary effects that are problematic. Uh, but yeah, generally, I think the more susceptible targets are going to be your microbes. So in my opinion, this is just me thinking out loud, it's almost more of a detriment to do uh, a treatment like that, because even if it's working at 100% effectiveness, you're cleaning the slate and anything can just jump on at that point. Or Yeah, I no, that's a good point. Like if you have, like to put it in like a human microbiology context, like you have microbes on your skin, um, you know, and you have them in your stomach and all around, uh, inside and outside. But like, if you take uh, an antimicrobial that's maybe, that's very potent and it affects many different kinds of microbes in your gut, you know, you might have an imbalance that occurs because of it, right? And depending on your what you feed yourself, you might also, and this gets into very political, I guess, territory, very controversial, but essentially, you might make circumstances more uh, conducive to some microbes over others. Let's just put it that way, very neutrally. That's true. And so the same thing can happen in plants. Uh, so how about this? How about the best strategy for us would be to, if on the days that we were going to use a treatment like the Trioxy Complete, they say after 45 minutes, it's, it's back to being just water. So wait 45 minutes after treatment and then go back in and apply a Bavaria bassiana or something like that to at least have a positive microbe established. Would that probably be the best strategy? I, would, I, I totally agree. Yeah, so I would say that for people who are focusing on cultivating and maintaining a, a microbiome of a particular kind in the phylosphere and in the rhizosphere, if you apply a sterilant like that or something that has that strong oxidation effect, um, or sort of bioreactive effect, then reapplying uh, sort of an inoculant of, of some kind is very helpful. And I would, I would say that people who are trying to cultivate should do exactly that. When that safe, it's important to know when that safe area is though, that's that safe time period. And that's a part of IPM, yeah. definitely. Well, that was kind of what we liked about that product was, I mean, it was basically water. I mean, it's, <laughs> they've added, you know, some ozone in with water. So as far as safety goes, it's, you know, it off gases oxygen. It's not exactly a dangerous off gassing thing. Right. Um, 
Oh, uh, just <laughs> since we were talking about the cannabis aphid earlier, um, or rather the hop aphid as a speculatory thing, um, just for people who are curious about how far the cannabis aphid can actually fly, um, if we take the hop aphid as an example, there are three main ways the hop aphid disperses through wind. Um, a stratiform drift, what's called cumuliform high-level migration, and what's called boundary layer migration. These are all technical terms that refer to various ways of using the atmosphere to fly. Um, the, one of the defining characteristics of insects in general is that they fly. They are part of a group called hexapods, so they have six legs, but some six-legged things aren't insects. Only insects are insects, and for the vast majority of insects, their adult form has wings and they can fly, or at least they could. In some cases, they've lost that, like with fleas, for example, the adult form does not have any wings at all. And can you give an example of a six-legged creature that is not an insect? Absolutely. Um, people find it all the time. In fact, I'm asked about this more than I've asked about pests almost, and that's the springtails, the columbula. Um, there are many different kinds of springtails. They're very diverse. They're found in soil often. They're those little small creatures. I'm sure that many people, as I describe this, will come to realize that they're maybe looking at these uh, right now. Springtails are small, usually white. They usually have the ability to sh jump uh, what are short distances for us, but massive distances for them. Um, and they're also, they also usually have a hydrophobic cuticle. So if you water your plants and you have like a pool of water that forms, you might see them kind of mat up at the surface. But with all of these different um, sort of uh, migration. So that, that's the springtail, right? Exactly. That's a springtail. In Holy fact, cow. I'm not that close. In <laughs> fact, I think that's Podoromorpha. I think that's in the Podoromorpha group, possibly. Man, that would be such a cool dog to have. <laughs> I, I've always thought a coconut crab would be pretty cool as a pet. Um, it's a massive freaking crab, man. Like, <laughs> they can, yeah, like, they're freaking. And, and then there are like thousands or hundreds of thousands of them like walking across the ground, right? Yeah, like in where they live. Yeah, I always thought that'd be a really neat experience because... You know, we don't have a whole lot of large arthropods. And I, of course, uh, people who know me know, I, I find them pretty interesting. So, plus they can, they can crack a coconut. So, I mean, you got to watch out, but. <laughs> I was going to say, I'd be a little, a little on edge. <laughs> um, oh, but just to give some, some metrics to go with the uh, migration patterns for cannabis aphid with these three um, uh, examples for the hop aphid. Um, usually in one piece of literature, which I referenced in my video, um, uh, short range migration that happens around spring, uh, is usually below like 20 kilometers, which I think is like 12, mi like 12 miles diameter. So like, uh, hop aphids can usually move or usually tend to move around that far, um, in the early spring. Cannabis aphids may do may have the same capability or a greater capability. Um, in other literature, they've tracked hop aphids at moving a maximum of like 150 kilometers, uh, which is like 93 miles, which is pretty far distance. So, if we use this as a reference and we um, extrapolate from the hop aphid literature cannabis aphids might also be able to move as extensively as like almost 100 miles and at least within a territory of about uh, territory is not the right term but an area of around 12 miles so in that way um, cannabis aphids can propagate pretty well if there's a bunch of people but they're like spread out um, i would say that there's probably uh quite a bit of i mean there's no way to really quantify it but i'm sure that that's happened um, to many people who grow outdoors. So oftentimes, especially outdoor, there's a few things you can do to make the surrounding environment that you're going to grow in less suitable for a pest. So what would be tips for the aphid? What, what kind of things? I mean, obviously, one of the things that probably is for all general insects is to try to keep any cover crops or, or anything growing like grass or anything like that under your plants fairly short, but uh, do you have anything else besides that? 
Well, with the cannabis aphid in particular, um, since they're a specialist, and as far as we know, they don't feed on other plants, the main thing that you can do is not have, well, you don't always have the ability to control these things, but if you're able to grow, if you're growing in like a rather remote area and you're pretty confident that people aren't growing near you, at least within like a 15 mile radius, then, and especially much more if like it's in a remote setting, maybe in a rural setting where there's not a whole lot of like uh, little things that can transfer the, the organism maybe on like a, a car or a piece of flotsam in the air or some sort of like what we call a fomite, something that can be an inoculant that can carry the, the pest. Um, that's, that's a big thing that you can do just right off the bat, location, location, location. Um, if you aren't in that situation though, you can create wind barriers. I know somebody who's uh, in California right now who, were, who was growing and they were growing up in the mountains and they used a combination of a tree line and um, like wooden planks that they've that they produced. And they were using that as a buffer that would uh, buffet the thrips and the aphids from uh, getting into their indoor space. And I feel like it worked really well because they, um, at the very least, they had the problem initially. And then after growing, they didn't have the problem anymore. Um, but of course, really you would cool. have to do this multiple times to really, you know, quantify that. And, and it's possible that they just had a uh, particularly uh, difficult time where the climate was different. Um, thrips in particular, they are sometimes called thunderbugs because they are associated with thunderstorms. And that's because the barometric pressure changes and air changes and they are sensitive to that and they alight on the uh, higher winds. Um, a lot of insects are weak flyers and they really require the wind to move in the atmosphere. I mean, in fact, uh, a lot of arthropods use the wind and they don't have any wings at all because they're so small, they can either produce silk like spider mites. Yes, they, they do move and travel in the wind and so do russet mites for that matter. They do have the capacity, they're like 200 micrometers long um, and they do catch the wind and they do move um, quite, a big, uh, quite a big distance because they can, can get thrust up into the uh, upper atmosphere and they can travel uh, pretty long distances, believe it or not. That's a great point. And I think a lot of people miss that um, to IPM your outside, even for indoor grows. I think that's an important point, you know, and, and I've brought this up before on other podcasts, but I'll say it again here. Like you come into Mint Canico, I mean, it's surrounded by gravel for a reason. <laughs> we, we, we want the least amount of bug pressure as possible. So um, yeah, we didn't play around with that. There's nothing planted on the outside for decoration, you know, nothing. It's, it's, it's a desert around the, around the building on purpose. Personally, I think I, I, as you well know, that's a really great move. And I know that maybe it's not pretty and it's not aesthetic and, you know, that has its own sort of, effects on a business or a place at large but i think that's the responsible thing to do from a biosecurity standpoint um it's definitely less costly than potentially harboring pests and then also if they're in your other property that they're not in your greenhouse that you scout for um then you might have like spider mites growing on your plants and you might constantly treat for them and you might spend thousands upon thousands of dollars when the spider mites just keep re-inoculating like literally 10 feet away. I knew somebody who was dealing with rice root aphid for that reason. They had a bunch of um, feral rye uh, plants that were just sprouting out in this sort of like urban area. Uh, it was actually a junkyard. And like, they were like, why aren't we getting these rice root aphids? Like, we don't have anything close by. We have no cannabis plants. Like, you know, we don't see anything. And it was right next to their door. Like I took a sprig or a, a stem of this plant and they were right on that plant and there were tons of them. So you have to really be cognizant of that. And it can, you know, weeding, even a few plants can save you in some cases, thousands of dollars in labor and product and yeah, time I, and worry. I, I got a jet on you, I hate to do this, but uh, it's dinner time and uh, I hate my food getting cold, so. <laughs> It was awesome to hang with you. Absolutely. Yeah, bro, I really thank, appreciate thank, the thanks insight. for jumping on. 
Yeah, Thanks for having really. me again. I, I, I figured kind of w- one of the things I wanted to do is to get people in different regions. Like you said, aphids aren't really a big deal for you in Michigan. Uh, and I just asked Tyler uh, Blue of Green Tank to jump on just to quickly talk about uh, kind of the bugs he sees in Maine and northern New England. So we'll. I think we'll here in Michigan, for- I can just give you that report. Here in Michigan, it's mostly like everywhere else. Thrips is the big one this year. Thrips are is the ones that we're having to deal with, and it's mostly just biocontrols that we're using, just uh, sachets of different mixes of uh, predator mites. Is how we attack that. Yeah, I really appreciate the insight. And I, I like that you did that, Peter. Like, uh, it'd be great to get other people's experiences. It's my hope that we can get various pests um, uh, or pest location information, be able to get it like a map of how bad it is in different places. That would be great as a resource. All right. Well, amazingly, we now have the northern coastal Maine uh, correspondent, Tyler, reporting from, from the coast. <laughs> Tyler, tell us what you're seeing bug-wise in Maine. Live from the coast here. <laughs> uh, bug-wise, I just got out of the greenhouse, actually. What's up, Matt? How you doing? Uh, blue I'm and green great. tank. Mr. Avocado Tech. Um, yeah, I just got out of the greenhouse um, and scouting some plants outside. No, do I not have any audio? No. I don't know. We hear you. We hear you. I can oh, hear you. Sorry. Um, and uh, yeah, I was just taking a spin there. And luckily, it seems pretty pest free in the Northeast right now for me. Just a few leaf miners, leaf hoppers. And um, yeah, not much else damage at all yet thus far. I expect the aphids to come in a little later as they normally do uh, in this area. Um, well, yeah, just, I, I was going to say just generally like friends who grow in the Northeast, like for the past couple of years, kind of what have been the yeah. ebbs and flows of dominant pest uh, pests that you're dealing uh, with? Yeah, I mean, Pre- mainly, present company inclu- excluded. Right, right. Present company excluded. Mostly I hear stories of um, I got it. Uh, your standard aphid. I don't know what the correct term is, but a green aphid uh, in the younger instar and then, uh, you know, black winged aphid as it gets older. Um, I do have a little bit of uh, experience growing hops as well. And so I have dealt with aphids on my hops um, as well as of course the spider mites, Um, but not much else. I mean, in my area and I associate with mostly growers in my own area, you know, we live on an island. And so I don't know if that has a, um, plays a role in sort of stifling some of the populations getting out here. But uh, the main problem I I think would be just your standard aphid um, and spider mites in this area. How, um, uh, where is your location exactly? Um, Um, I'm on the like mid to Northern coast of Maine. Uh, Mount Desert Island is the name of the island. It is connected by a land bridge, but, uh, but yeah. um, How cold is it getting up there? Uh, it gets very cold in the winter. I'd say our our biggest stretch of cold weather is in January, and it's generally negative ten to negative twelve, fifteen in that area. So that's a gets really, cold. That, that's very cold. Um, I just yeah. want I, I love that you brought that up, and I'm glad that you're here to talk about this because it re, it brings up a really excellent point. Earlier, I said that a lot of aphids will overwinter with eggs. Um, some of them will overwinter um, as like adults. And there are strategies, there are advantages to this. With as eggs, they're very durable and it allows them to overwinter pretty well, especially if they're in like a small little, uh, like if they're in like a dead plant or not inside rather, but if they're in the debris or something like that, they can sort of have some insulation and they can exist over that cold period. Um, some aphids don't do this, however, but they are still more susceptible. And so when it gets really, really cold like that, uh, the closer it gets to like, zero degrees Celsius, you know, and, and below, if that happens, <laughs> it can be incredibly lethal, but even somewhere covering around like one or two degrees Celsius is still going to be very deleterious. Like sometimes aphids keep their stylet in the plant and then they freeze and then, or, and like they move and like different parts of the plant, the plant surface might freeze or the insides might be insulated, but because of this disparity, they might wreck their mouth parts and they'll starve. So they might, it might not kill them outright, but it does cause them to not be able to feed and then eventually they die over time. Um, some paralytic pesticides are like that where 
they uh, they cause a paralysis in the insect. And although they're still moving around, um, they will either discolor or they'll eventually die because they can't actually feed. So huh. that brings up another question for me. Then, how what would be a strategy or what would you suggest for overwintering uh, beds during a fallow period during the winter? Would you suggest uh, this past season, I, I uh, top dressed or, or battened down my bed um, in my greenhouse, the, the cover comes off and I battened it down with uh, straw, uh, pretty health healthily. I was trying to maybe preserve uh, some of my biology and worm population if possible, just by sort of like piling it on top. But is that a good strategy or is that a strategy that might harbor pests? Piling what on top? Uh, straw, just uh, I took my uh, grassroots fabric beds uh, removed uh, the cover off the greenhouse, removed the trellising, and then uh, put a healthy layer probably up to almost two feet of straw over my entire bed just to sort of, you know, batten it down for the winter. Is that a good strategy or is that something that could be a problem? Um, my favorite answer is it's complex, but yeah, there are advantages to that for sure, especially if you want to keep the microbial action um, like uh, not totally slowed. Um, and something to just going to be susceptible and they'll die um, from the cold and that sort of a thing. And the worms too. Right. But um, there, is a, there is a possibility that straw can indeed harbor pathogens. Um, if you can pasteurize the straw, that can be helpful um, in some cases. But it is possible, like some organisms, they lay their eggs in and around debris. Ex you know, like the Bagrata bug, which I've seen on cannabis too. It's a very common pest. Um, I have a pest primer video on the Bagrata bug and uniquely for that species in its group, it actually has a unique function um, when it oviposits. It oviposits on the ground instead of ovipositing on plants. And it's, it's very uh, delinquent in that behavior, um, but it's adaptive because it allows the eggs to not get destroyed by something by the plant or something on the plant. Um, and it's able to kind of uh, hide its eggs in like nooks and crannies, if that makes sense. So there's always that possibility that a, that a pathogenic microbe or um, some pest or its eggs might, might come in on straw. But at the same time, you know, you can mitigate that to a degree. Excellent. Yeah, I was more thinking of sort of if there was a pest population in the bed and then you know, battening it down and insulating it may help it survive um, rather than sort of using that cold to your advantage to to wipe out anything that might be there. But, you know, a solid negative 10 seems to uh, take out most things in my experience. This is definitely true. It's one of the advantages when you live in a place with actual seasons, unlike myself, who lives in Southwest California. And, you know, it doesn't have as I get hot and hotter. So, so, so things can be, some things can be problematic in that way for insects too, because they're exotherm. So they can't regulate their body temperature in the up or in the down very well. At least the vast majority can't. So if you get it really hot, like over 35 degrees C, um, which some plants will wilt heavily and you have to like stress them out or not stress them out. You have to water them so they don't totally stress out. Um, or you remove them from a greenhouse, you can cook that greenhouse and kill like thrips and their pupae and aphids and all kinds of things that you might be worried are inside uh, an indoor uh, location. Huh. Um, if they still have the plants though, they can still get water usually and they can still survive to some degree, at least with, with aphids, for example, and other sort of uh, stylet using insects. It's hard to make total generalizations, but certain aspects of physiology can be um, sort of generalizable, if that makes sense. Well, that gets to some of the conversation that was going on a while ago. Uh, people were talking about like pumping CO2 into greenhouses uh, to keep the pest pressure down. So what are your thoughts on CO2 and greenhouses? That's exactly what I was just going to ask. Exactly. <laughs> That's a great, great question. CO2 um, can disinfect, or rather, it can it can make a situation. So, arthropods they some arthropods breathe through their skin almost like mites do. Some mites they're just they just have very thin skin and they like kind of breathe through it. Insects typically have spiracles, 
um, but they require passive pressure for the air to flow into those spiracles. It's not like a, it's not like us where we actually like have lungs that like uh, suck in through negative pressure the air. So that's important for two reasons. One, it's why you won't see giant insects anytime soon unless the oxygen level in the air uh, rises drastically. It's one reason why we don't see such large insects, or at least one of the theorized reasons anyways. Uh, predation certainly is a big part of that too, by birds and other sorts of things. Um, but CO2, the amount of CO2 you would have to have to essentially oxygen deprive, like a russet mite, for example, uh, the concentration would be, have to, be pretty high. And if you don't have a hermetic seal, if you don't have some way to seal the CO2 and you have a leak, you might never reach that pressure or it might be incredibly expensive in practical terms to actually utilize it. But theoretically, yes. Like I could see where if you wanted, you could like <laughs> some contraption that like you put a plant into. Um, but CO2 has other problems because if you have high levels, you can, it can also be toxic for people, of course, and way before it's toxic to um, humans or rather uh, insects that are much smaller. But I could see a contraption where you could put a plant in um, and seal it and then high, uh, heighten the CO2 to a high amount and maybe like starve out and suffocate insects and other things in there and then just take it out. But um, I don't know, I don't think that's very practical, you see. Yeah, I, I uh, have gone through this conversation several times with uh, growers in the chat and uh, other ones and I, I just try to stress the folks that that uh, yeah theoretically it could work but there's so many variables especially in living soil i mean if you have a blue mat system and you're running a blue soak and you're running a aerated reservoir is it possible that anything hugging up to the blue soak could maintain enough oxygen to kind of be immune to that that co2 kind of um blast and i just feel like it doesn't seem to me to be like a very practical method yeah, and it would be hard, again, sort of to quantify that, I feel like. I, I don't really know. Uh, the best answer I could give is, is plausible, I suppose, but that's not very helpful, right? So <laughs> I wanted to take a comment from the chat. Zolbard, with two A's, says, um, bugs can't suck up pectin and mold can't grow in pectin. That's what calcium makes in between the cell walls. And I wanted to bring up this because um, that's kind of true, except for the fact that a lot of insects, in fact, pretty much all herbivorous insects, and um, a lot of different uh, fungi that are parasitic to plants produce pectinase and, um, you know, cellulase and cutinase and other sorts of enzymes with that A's at the end that dissolve pectin, cutin, and um, cellulose, which make up the cell wall. So that's, that's true. That structure is a defensive structure, but organisms that have adapted over hundreds of millions of years, like 500 million years for arthropods and insects and that sort of a thing, um, they, they have some ways to digest and um, get rid of these defense structures. That's why they're so successful in the first place. And um, in the very early arthropod history of evolution, picking up microbes um, through being a detrivore and eating decaying things allowed a lot of arthropods to um, essentially culture a microbiome. And, some, and a lot of times there's like a kind of a two for one going on where the insect's genome produces or has genes that produce these enzymes that allow them to eat the plants. And they have microbes in their gut that further allow them to eat the plants um, in a similar sort of way or in a different sort of way, like uh, detoxifying the uh, plant compounds or that sort of a thing. So I just wanted to bring that up. Yeah, because di didn't we have a past conversation where you were talking about you, you didn't think that, you know, nutrient deficiencies, which, you know, maybe w essentially make the plants sick are necessarily like the main cause of getting aphids, right? Because aphids can also, in your, in your, if I remember, and if it was you, uh, attack healthy plants too. Yeah, I'm. I do make that point a lot because it's a very pernicious point that other people make, and it's sort of contentious. I'll definitely say that um, a healthy plant, and depending on how you define the word healthy, um, 
it's going to be much more resistant to uh, parasitation or predation, herbivory, any of those things. But there are some pathogens out there that they have tons of adaptations to overmatch that. And that's why they're so successful. And there are many um, sort of factors that can weigh into the resistance of a plant. Like, and also for that matter, a, a thing a lot of people I think forget is that a plant might be able to um, survive. A lot of plant strategies to survival is that they, they, can, they can like let a caterpillar eat all the leaves down and it can just make more leaves or it can just um, sort of go through a state of torpor over the like um, winter season or something and then bring the leaves back when the uh, larvae no longer are there to feed on the leaves. So like that might be great for the plant, but in, an, in a commercial cultivation uh, situation that won't fly. And so like our human context is much more, um, like it was a much more higher level of pest control than even uh, nature would maybe allow for, if, if that makes sense. Essentially outpacing the pest with, with growth. Is that what you mean? Yeah, either outpacing the pest with growth. Uh, maybe they produce compounds in the new growth or only the old growth so that um, maybe the new growth or the old growth, depending on the plant, is more or less susceptible. Um, Maybe they have a close association with ants, which is common for a lot of plants in the tropics. Um, there's a bunch of different aspects of resistance. And I think that also a plant can look ugly and eat up and not something you would wanna buy for yourself. But if, as long as it's able to reproduce, then the, the reproductive fitness of the plant is still viable. So that's another important context to keep in mind, resistance is kind of a uh, gradient. So the, pl uh, the plant might not, um, it might not be able to uh, keep every single pest off of its leaves, but it's able to reproduce at the end of the season. And that's all that essentially matters from a reproductive standpoint. Uh, Are there any are there any uh, fertigation strategies or any like technique uh, techniques that you that you know of that could sort of say you see a, a little bit of a specific pest pressure to kind of like to put the, the plan on high alert, so to speak? I mean, is there any way to sort of like introduce a stressor that may aid, you know, say you see your first signs of aphids and is, you know, maybe they're just rolling into your area, so to speak. And uh, is there anything that you could do to to sort of preempt that, that, uh, that response from the plant? Absolutely. Um, so a lot of people have heard of systemically acquired resistance and induced systemic response. I believe I'm saying those right, ISR, SAR. And so stressors, stressors can be uh, elucidated through certain chemical compounds. Um, in nature, plants are responsive to things called effectors or also things called um, uh, pests or like, for example, there's a microbially associated molecular particles or patterns. And these are little molecules that are produced by various microbes through their physiological processes that the plant has developed to recognize. And when they recognize these compounds, they set off, it sets off an alarm response, kind of like what would happen in our own immune system. But it's important to notice that this, these compounds are oftentimes very broad. Uh, they're not really specific to a certain pathogen always. And uh, pathogens can have counter ad adaptations that allow them to hide those uh, effectors, or maybe they don't break apart in the same way, or they don't fit into the receptors of certain um, uh, sort of immune response receptors in the plant and that sort of a thing. So there's a bunch of like factors with regards to that. But what, I've, what I'm getting at is that even a beneficial uh, or seemingly what we would call a beneficial microbe, like maybe a fungus that systemically colonizes the plant, like the Bouveri bassia and I mentioned, it could systemically colonize the plant. And if a, pl if a pest were to eat that plant, um, two things might happen. One, the microbe being in the plant 
can elicit an immune response, but maybe the Bouveri bassiana either avoids it or suppresses it or the immune response is ineffective. But because of the colonization inherently, the plant is sort of um, elicited, if that makes sense. And then the second thing is that even more directly, the Bouveri bassiana, which kills insects, might get in the tissue and a plant uh, insect might feed on that tissue and then that gets the uh, hyphae and the um, tissue of the, of the pathogen, the insect pathogen into its body and then it might sporulate and mycosize the insect. So one, the plant might produce defense compounds just from being colonized by certain microbes that might not even be pathogenic. And two, certain microbes might actually be pathogenic to insects and so they're herbivores there's a very famous microbe, I'm forgetting if it's a fungus or a bacteria, but there's something in a certain kind of grass or fodder. And I think when horses feed on it, it produces a toxin and it kills the horses. So, you know, that's one other example where this happens. Um, and it's a, it's a big tragedy for people who raise horses and that sort of a thing. Yeah, I guess the angle I was coming at it from was, um, you said, that um, how they can sort of uh, chemically blend in or hide. And I wondered if there was a way to sort of like expose them since you said there were some general, you know, th through different species that, that may be detected by the plant. And I was thinking maybe, you know, a well-timed um, top dress of some insect frass, you know, like kind of signaling the plant that there is some insect pressure falsely, even though, though there's just early signs could be a, a method of doing that. Oh, absolutely. Um... Or That's actually you... interesting. If, if the plant were like went on high alert because it's like there are a lot of bugs around me. Absolutely, That's... it's the chi it's the chitin in fungal plant or fungal cells and the exoskeleton of insects. So when they when the cells literally come into contact with like the mandibles, or um, the hyphae of the fungus, immune response. That's exactly right. Yes, and it might even elicit the the creation of chitinase which would break down the chitin. And so what can happen is that microbes can even produce chitinase or other chitinolytic compounds inside the plant. And then like citric acid, for example, is chitinolytic. It's not chitinase, it's not an enzyme, but it's a compound that over time will dissolve uh, chitin. And if their structure is made out of chitin, like the, uh, let's say the intestinal tract of certain caterpillars or most caterpillars, then that chitinase or that chitinolytic compound will eat away and erode the intestinal tract and they'll get sepsis. I have a video about that on my YouTube channel too. Um, and what was cool was that the microbes that produced that were in the soil, traveled up the plant, and then were eaten by the caterpillar. So it definitely can happen. And I'm curious to know how we can harness this in a much more sort of focused way. That's, I think, a really interesting aspect of agricultural science moving forward. What, uh, what was the plan? I'm, <laughs> I'm super high right now, but, uh, what, what, what was the, the, uh, flowering plant that attracted the predators? Was that the Arias or something else? Ah, the Arias was the minute pirate bug, but the ah, alyssum, right, right. the Alyssum was the plant, and there's a ton of other plants. And, uh, and how do you spell that one? Right, A L Y S S U M, I believe. Oh yeah, no, it's all coming back. That it's not, uh... <laughs> but no, 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 because what I wanted to get into was, you know, we're talking about all these strategies, but another one is obviously companion planting. Uh, uh, so what what are some plants that you recommend uh, to? either uh, in the case of alyssum or however you pronounce it that attract the predators, but then also plants that uh, ward off the uh, aphids and other bugs. Say that last part again. Well, j just the ones that the aphids and other uh, unwanted bugs don't like. Oh, I see. So like marigold or whatever. Well, it's, um, it's contentious. I don't think it's always um possible to to know like some for one thing okay this is my perspective on it one i think that a lot of times companion plants that are not um they're not susceptible to certain pests because of the compounds they produce that you can kind of use to like repel insects 
it can be very difficult to use this effectively because one, it's hard to not quantify it or it's hard to quantify the response, but two, um, you can end up with a situation where insect populations that might be pestiferous might still feed on it a little bit or they might just fly over it, you know? So they can move in 3D and some much more sort of deathly than others. And so you kind of run into a problem where companion plants might be a wasted effort in that way. But if they are attracting a bunch of biocontrol agents and they, they aren't just meant to be repellent because of the compounds they exude or produce, in the pedosphere, which is the, the general soil area, um, or the sort of um, phylosphere or the atmosphere, then um, th that's much more useful. You kind of get two possible uh, positives instead of one. Um, also, you know, resistance to compounds is a thing that happens. It's literally how evolution works. And uh, just as it is the case with us using pesticides and then certain pests become resistant to those pesticides, the same thing can happen with local populations of various insects and those um, sort of compounds that are repellent. Like over time, a population, especially something like aphids, which are able to clone themselves very rapidly and adapt uh, very rapidly, despite not having a whole lot of um, sexual reproduction, uh, that can happen as well. Um, not to rain on anyone's parade for using companion plants at all. In fact, it's a thing that I like to make use of when, when possible. Hopefully that wasn't too much of a downer. <laughs> yeah, I, I definitely use them and I feel like I use them to with a pretty great deal of success. Uh, I use mullen in my greenhouse, which uh, you know has that kind of furry leaf to it. And always I find a variety of species of insects on there. So just adding to the variety I feel is really important um, for my uh, for my grow in general, but um, you know I, I think that that as many of those plants uh, that are you know pollen bearing as well uh, really add to the to the mix, and uh, I have very little problems I think due to that, and then also just propagating soil health to make the plant um, you know ready for those types of things, and then beyond that, my companion planting, which is somewhat um, contentious, is I like to use uh, cucumber and squash with my plants and um, I feel as though they're a great vehicle for me to remove a pest if necessary completely since it's not my target crop. Um, if I notice something, I generally notice it on those first and then if necessary, which is normally not necessary, I just remove them completely from the area and uh, I've had really good success with that. Method. Well, so they're kind of like your sacrificial plants where like the bugs are like, I prefer this, I'll right. eat they're the cannabis, like but I'd much rather eat this. My canary in the coal mine, if you will, right. definitely. That's uh, and I utilize them inside and out for that same reason. And generally, uh, what I do instead is that canary in the coal mine allows me to go come up with an IPM strategy, uh, generally a predator insects, and uh, have very great success with that. And again, I'm not trying to eliminate all pests from my garden. I'm just trying to keep them at a threshold where they do not damage my target crop. You know, that's very wise. Time. That's very wise. Um, I have this. I have a series of cannabis IPM videos. Uh, one of them is much smaller than the other one. Uh, the first one is, and I go into talking about exactly what you're saying. Um, sentinel crops, sentinel plants, um, are very useful in that way. If you're if you're if you're tenacious, if you're vigilant, then they're incredibly useful. I run into problems where people are not this way, and I can I can have problems. But it very, very much from the way that you're saying this, it seems to me like you're, you've got it uh, on lockdown. Um, but yeah. one thing that we could do, even from a non-local perspective, like strategically, like as, an, as a nation or a country or a county even, or a city, it can be very useful, I think, if we can establish what are called sentinel plants, especially at areas where, um, and I know this is used in other countries, um, where like where airports happen and that sort of a thing so that at, at nexuses of transport you have these plants and you set them up at both locations so like for example you might set up some plants in Japan and you might set them up in you know California let's say and they're they're crop plants and you keep these fields so that you can tell okay well if a new introduced organism comes in 
and it's from if it's on the Japanese uh, of this uh, if it's, if it's on the population of plants in Japan and also that same population in California and there's an association and it's like native to Japan or something then right away um, you can tell that that's a problem in California every year there's a new introduction of various organisms various uh, insects for example and there's a study by um, I don't remember who it was, but I was talking with Mark Hoddle, who is a uh, biocontrols researcher, and uh, he's working on a spotted lanternfly. And I was speaking to him, and I have a podcast where we can where you can listen to that podcast uh, with the Crop Talk Media. And anyways, what he told us was that um, typically a, a good proportion of those introduced uh, insects every year turn out to be pests. So every year. Um, that's the case. And there's research that sort of backs this up. And so uh, sentinel crops and that sort of a thing can be very useful, both from a local perspective and also from a greater perspective. And again, I hope that various countries and cities within those countries can um, help their own agriculture and also people in residential sections from having this pest problem. Because uh, just like with the spotted lanternfly in eastern U.S., it's a and Korea, South Korea, and China, where it's originated from, it's a massive pest, causes millions of dollars of damage, and of course, it's not great for people on the residential property either. So, I like that. That's a great strategy. I, I also wanted to just stress um, that um, I think it's super important to use sentinel or trap plants, banker plants companion plants and deterrent plants all together because a lot of time you'll see a lot of times you'll see somebody pick one strategy and run with it and i think it's really crucial to utilize all of them for success the i in integrated pest management is the most important part i totally agree with you banker plants i have some research with the president of the cannabis horticultural association uh, based on some research, a video which is also on my YouTube channel, where I Russell. talk about Russell. Are we talking about Russell the Love we Muscle? We are talking about Russell. That's correct. Which we'll be talking um, next Saturday. Is that right? Uh, I believe so. And what were we going to talk about? I, I we're we just going to do a smorgasbord of topics, or uh, well, it'll probably evolve over time. But mainly, we're going to talk about the banker plant system. That ah, okay. Developed. So th yeah. this is a segue into that topic. All right. Yeah. Excellent. So, so um, using specifically uh, pepper plants. So there are various pepper plants that you can use, and even ones that normally fruit that you use like that as like vegetables essentially um, can be used. <laughs> but in the research that I made a video about, they they were looking at ornamental peppers because the ornamental peppers they flower for longer. They're meant to be mostly for flowers and not for their fruit. And so why is that important? Because some predatory mice are omnivorous and they feed on pollen. They won't feed on so much pollen that they'll like rob a plant of all of its pollen, by the way. Um, so if you're worried about using it in cannabis or if you're a breeder or something, don't worry about that so much. But uh, these predatory mites, your type three predatory mites. And if you're curious about those types, I also have videos on that, but their type three are omnivorous. Uh, so they often eat a bunch of different pest species like Swirsky, uh, feeds on um, thrips, white flies, uh, broad mites, russet mites, um, and also feeds on pollen. In fact, it's very fecund on pollen. It can triple, and at least in this research, it tripled its, uh, the females tripled their reproduction rate on, um, on pollen, on a pollen only diet, in, in fact. So you can use these banker plants to sort of garrison the predatory mites in your crop. And at the very least, you can use them as like what some people would use in biocontrol as like sachets. But because they're plants, there are downsides instead of being sachets. For one, they might get pests. So you have to crop scout those as well. You have to treat them like you treat the entire crop. And I'm sure you're very well aware of this, but um, some of those, some of the exploding ember peppers in particular, and Russell is, has cultivated many of these up where he is. And um, the exploding ember in the research was able to have 1,100, far and away more than the other two that they looked at, um, of Swirsky and Cucumris, I think, or one of one of the two. And they're very; um, these are very comparative uh, predatory mites. They both have; they're both in the same type, type three. 
Um, so that's just really fascinating to me. Hoverflies, the adults like pollen and nectar um, and other stuff, and they'll, they'll, uh, they'll lay their eggs as well. So you can attract a couple of different biocontrol agents, but if you're using some commercial biocontrols, you can kind of extend their life possibly by using these pepper plants as well. So I totally support that. How about uh, stradiolalaps? Do they consume pollen? Not to my knowledge, although some of them, some in the lalapidae in that family. So stradiolalaps and hypoaspis are both kind of um, what are called waste bin taxa. Um, what that means is that there are a bunch of different species that all look identical. And there might even be cryptic species that we haven't identified between each other using like genome sequencing and stuff. But this is important because the various cultures of these species, um, they are using commercial biocontrols. And like I said earlier, when we culture insects, sometimes they lose important things about their physiology, like symbionts, or they might uh, gain parasites because they're kept in areas. And there's various uh, viral and bacterial and fungal pathogens that could be a problem for various arthropods if they're kept and there's no quality control, which these biocontrol companies uh, use. That's why, you know, it's why their facilities are the way that they are. Um, and I was going somewhere with that. But, oh yeah, but so anyways, those two species, you might be getting one thing, you might be getting another thing. You might get some things that are similar from outside, but they tend to feed on um, prey and sometimes even uh, fungi and that sort of a thing too. I, I asked that because um, in learning about the, the pollen consuming predators, I, uh, it's, it's anecdotal, but I uh, put down, um, granulated bee pollen, organic granulated bee pollen, and on my soil. Um, and aside from having a nice fungal bloom from it, I thought that I might, you know, feed some of these predators. But now in, in uh, understanding that maybe they consume fungi, then maybe that's what uh, led to a, it led to a massive boom in my population. If you go back a ways and look at my Instagram story, I've got these populations that people are like, How, what the heck? And I use avocado tech, which you may or may not be familiar with, which helps I think probably propagate some prey for them anyway. But um, I did notice with the application, a light application on the soil surface of granulated bee pollen that uh, I had a huge boom in, um, in predator populations, soil-borne predator predators. Wait, but additionally, the worms are eating the bee pollen, so that must make amazing uh, worm poo. Yeah, I found it just to be overall very, very beneficial. Yeah. the. Um... I'm often asked about little uh, moving mites that might be soil predatory mites, like in that hypoaspiny group that we're referring to, like Stradiolalaps and hypoaspis and their relatives in that uh, Lalapidae family. Um, mm -hmm. And like, you know, it's really not possible for me to know visually what exactly the species is, but there's a ton of those sort of like predatory or omnivorous predatory mites that will feed on like fungi and pollen possibly, pollen's one of the oldest um, arthropod food sources, especially for insects. So there's a lot of like, because they're basically, and that's why some pollen is toxic. So one other thing to mention is that for some arthropods like predatory mites, like certain pollen sources are, are poisonous. Huh. Um, like uh, I think uh, it was silver pine, was that it? Silver spruce, was it? There was a spruce or a pine. There's a research report and a video I made about it that talked about this and also talked about how certain kinds of pollen, like peach pollen and tea pollen, tea plant, could help predatory mites resist um, ultraviolet radiation stress. So there are ways you can even benefit your predators um, by feeding them the right kinds of food, which is pretty fascinating to me. Another sort of niche bleeding edge facet of IPM that people can possibly utilize. There, uh, sorry, I'm, I'm reading through the chat. People, hey, Jack, uh, Jack Greenstock, who you know and love from Southern California. Uh, let me get to it. I, I think the gist of what they're talking about is, is uh, water stressing plants and kind of like you know, a plant that, and I may be totally misinterpreting the, cause I'm trying to like read the 
back and forth chatter, but basically like water stressing plants and, you know, a plant that gets perfectly watered and never has to struggle versus a plant that, you know, maybe is, is looking for water and like, then it expresses itself and throws off terpenes. And, uh, so Jack, was I on the right path with that? Or am I totally thinking of something that you're not talking about? <laughs> I think we've talked about a similar topic before. I'll, I'm curious to see his response, but um, yeah, it's been a, it's a contentious point, right? Because on the one hand, you're, like, you're like, like, like he just mentioned hot peppers get much hotter when drought stressed. Exactly. And that's true. And um, vintners who are growing grapes in their vineyards will uh, stress out, they'll dry stress their grapes and that changes the acid and sugar ratios in the fruit. And you can't achieve certain kinds of grape product that you might then use for. D d does it drive more fruit or acid production? Sugar. I mean, uh, sorry, sugar, sugar or acid. Um, it, sugar, sugar. it depends on the cultivar, I think, actually. Of grapes? So some grapes may express exact opposite as others? Wow. Or at least different From my experience. ingredients. But what, what little, your experience? Blue also grows. Well, oh my God! What don't you grow? I don't grow grapes, but I I own a wine store, and uh, I hear lots of sales pitches for you know I've been doing this for twenty something years, and uh, a couple of the places that are of particular interest are uh, I took a, a trip to Humilla, Spain, and they have vineyards of um, Monastrell there, which are. Uh, the climate in Humia is very much like an Arizona type climate. It's very, very arid and uh, hot. And one of the side effects are these smaller, intense clusters of grapes um, due to that heat. And then also in areas like um, Sardinia on the southern tip, they have very sandy, uh, not too nutrient rich soils. And the same effect is there of that just stressing uh, the grapes, creating smaller clusters and higher bricks, higher sugar content in those in those wines. So it's kind of connected. Uh, that definitely is connected. So that's interesting. Um, I'm definitely not a vintner and I don't have all the information, but I guess that sort of makes sense. So, so you might have, le you might have more or less acid or sugar and that has a, an effect on the grape and the product. And so you can't actually achieve certain outcomes with wines that you then produce from those grapes or other culinary applications for that matter. But people, so cultivation techniques may stress a plant out, but it's to achieve a certain objective. And that's an important facet that I think people sometimes forget when it comes to cultivating any plant. And so when it comes to like wilting stress or like dry stress or, or rather a reduction of water, uh, some sort of water stress um, that can have many effects on plants and you can elicit an immune response essentially. That's what wilting is, it's an immune response. Yeah. So that can have a bunch of different cascade effects in the physiology of the plant. But I think that cannabis is so understudied that it's hard to really make anything but like broad generalizations and extrapolations from other plants, which a lot of people do. And some things are more generalizable than others. And that's an art all, all in itself, really. But I like that you brought that insight. Yeah, from my experience, my techniques when I'm, I'm not the 12th cycle now on a very controllable indoor um, setup. And I always go through the motions of uh, in later flower doing three things, uh, cutting water back or if not off completely, uh, lowering temperatures, and then also training light intensely on specific plants for specific periods of time. And I find I get really great trichome coverage for sure. And also uh, in controlling the temperature, never allowing it to go above 70, 70 degrees at a certain point in senescence, I find that I maintain a lot more of a monoterpene profile. It all sticks around. And I'm very careful in the entire process from late flower all the way to into the curing jar to never, ever let anything go above 70. Yeah, I, I like that's the sort of physiological, that's sort of like the phenotypical physiological um, facets of cultivation research I'm really looking forward to in cannabis. Um, yeah. Another important facet is that 
insects um, like the hemiptera that I was mentioning that use a sucking mouth part, like your aphids, your leaf hoppers, um, those sorts of things, they, if the water pressure is low, if the wilting happens, that can interfere with their ability to feed as well because they, they, they rely on this high pressure gradient. And um, if it's not high pressure, they've adapted to it rather, this particular pressure. And when that pressure isn't there, it can cause issues in their ability to feed. They might not get as much as they normally would, which they can still feed on, but it might make them reproduce less. It might make them more susceptible to damage from biocontrol agents um, and many other sort of, um, sort of subtle factors that kind of have a um, conglomerate effect. Very cool. Well, uh, Peter and Matt, I need to run right now, um, but always great talking with you. Thank you, Peter, for inviting me. And thank you, Matt, for your wealth of knowledge. And I love talking the um, experimental aspects of cannabis that we will be able to verify in the future. It's fascinating. I really appreciated talking with you. Thanks for jumping right. on, Tyler. True blue. I'm always down. Thanks again. All right. Cheers, guys. All right. See you. Uh, all right. So we, let's continue on with the presentation we get distracted easily yeah no 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 problem i think i was mostly talking about biocontrols for the most part um i was talking about like movement of cannabis aphids so let me do a little wrap up here since um it'll probably be useful for people maybe maybe we could put the timestamp <laughs> here for people who want to get the the recap but um so there's some things, cannabis aphids are not studied, they're understudied. And I expect that's, that research to uh, immensely and profusely change over the next decade, hopefully. But some of the things we can extrapolate from hop aphid because um, not only does it feed on the closest relative to cannabis that there is, but also it's probably diverged from the same lineage as the, as the same species in that genus, the forward on cannabis, for, uh, instead of Ford on Humuli. Um, some of those inferences are that not only is it a close relative, but um, that in the case of hop aphid, methyl salicylate, epsilon to hexanol and beta caryophyllene uh, were found to attract hop aphids. So this might also be the case for cannabis aphids, but again, that's kind of hard to quantify. Um, hop aphid dispersal can be anywhere between like, um, like 15 kilometers to 20 kilometers at like the median to uh, a maximum of like 100 to 150 kilometers in the right environment. Um, hop aphids are like many, many flying insects that are small. They're weak flyers and they mostly, but they are able to guide themselves. They're taken up by the wind currents, but they're not passive. They are actually actively seeking things with their eyes. They uh, pick up on, and this is not a this is not a comprehensive understanding of insect physiology, but they do use their eyes to seek out, um, you know, the right suitable prey. They or rather uh, plants. Um, they might react to things like ultraviolet radiation, which we don't see, but that they are sensitive to. Honeybees and many other insects are sensitive to it, and um, that might make them try to move out of a air current and try to land around that area. And again, it's sort of hard to, to talk about it comprehensively, but that's kind of how we understand it to be. And in good conditions, they can glide essentially for a very long period and a very long distance. So it's something to watch out for. Um, if you got cannabis aphids, it might not have happened. Well, for one thing, if there's no flyers that you can see, then they might not actually be uh, coming in from outside, they might have come in through infested plant material which is why quarantine is very useful. But if you are getting a bunch of flyers on the onset, the first time you're seeing them, especially like around autumn, then it's much more likely you're getting them from some location sort of close to you or at least in the local region. If you grow outside, then you're gonna be way more susceptible than if you're growing indoors. Um, epsilon, miraline, and germacrine D, uh, alpha pinene and beta pinene, were associated with hop aphid resistance in hops. So it's possible that these compounds or similar compounds can um, have a disruptive effect on the cannabis aphid, especially if it is associated with resistance in hops. Um, 
how it is uh, repellent or how it causes or signals the resistance is un would be unclear at this time. But uh, it's reasonable to intuit that uh, the compounds might be insecticidal in some way. Uh, they might have antifeedant pro properties, even if the insect doesn't become exposed to them through like trichomes. They might be exposed to them through their feeding but yeah, even through walking, like um, the glandular trichomes or oil glands and that sort of a thing in various plants can have um, a bunch of effects. They can even just have physical effects like trichomes being very sticky and gluing the plant physically or gluing the, the pest physically and not allowing it to move around. Um, and that was, that was the recap for the hop extrapolation. So some of these things that are true for hop may also be true for a cannabis aphid. Got it. Um, someone a while back um, was asking about uh, uh, sticky pads or what would, I, well, I'll sticky find these. Yellow sticky drops. Yeah. Yep. Yeah. So what are your thoughts on that? I mean, I'm looking for the exact words, but that's generally what they're asking about. Well, they aren't a good control, but they're a really great way to sample your pest population if you have a lot of plants. And even if you have a few plants, it's also really great to sample your sort of various arthropod and insect populations outside. If you're growing at home, you can set them out around your house and um, various things will stick to them. And sometimes those are living things uh, or recently killed things. And you can take those sticky traps uh, into your house and you can record what you find and it requires a level of like comprehension of like arthropod physiology and that's why you might have people like myself an IPM specialist who could help identify it for you which I'm always happy to do for people um, you know or you might take it to a university extension agent in your area like some sort of entomologist uh, who um, they're a big part of their job is to actually just identify pests not just I don't want to um, sort of reduce the reverence for it because it's a very important skill set that's that takes a long time to uh, become comfortable with. And sometimes you require microscopy and mounting and a bunch of other um, technical uh, accoutrement that you won't have at your house. But uh, in the broad scale, you can still get an idea of like, oh, this is a fly or, oh, this is a fungus gnat or this, these are aphids and they have wings and you might not get them in your indoor area, but you know, maybe for several weeks, you have aphids that are flyers that are moving around in your area and they're being attracted or they, or they just hit the uh, sticky trap and you're aware of them before they become part of your crop. And so if you become aware of them before they enter your house or your commercial facility, then you can make uh, the necessary preventative approaches. Sometimes it'll never become a problem or they might be an incidental problem. It just depends on the organism in question. Sometimes you also might get beneficials too, which can also be helpful to um, uh, ascertain because you might know what biocontrols are in your area like hoverflies, lady beetles, and that sort of a thing. So that was Al Heyman or Heymon uh, who asked that question a while back. Um, Purple Thumb OG a long time ago asked if you can uh, show an image of H Miles. So there's, did were, were you talking about this a long time ago? Yeah, we were talking about hypoaspis uh, and stradiolalaps, and that is a that is definitely what they look like. They have this sort of, and that's a good guy. That's a good guy. So you can, it keeps its uh, legs, um, one of its two legs that it keeps out to kind of use it like seek prey and it runs really fast. Um, as a general rule, and these are, there's a ton of exceptions to this because insects are incredibly complex. Uh, arthropods are very, 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 there's so many of them and they do so many things. Um, but generally speaking, an herbivore that's found your plant to be suitable to feed on will like stay put and feed on it. Whereas something that is a carnivore or predator often, but not always, uh, will be moving around a lot more unless it's like an ambush predator or something like a praying mantis, for example, or an ambush bug or something like this. 
So if you see a bunch of them running around, like in your compost and your vermicompost, um, like Clackamas Coot was talking about, um, you know, they're not detrimental. Uh, and they might, may very well be very beneficial and having them in your uh, compost area or in your soil is not gonna have a deleterious effect on your plants. Uh, someone asked uh, a while ago about Dr. Zymes. Do you like it? Do you use it? No, is I don't. It, is it amazing? <laughs> <laughs> is it amazing? Is he a wizard? Um, is he a doctor? Um, Dr. Zymes, I've had good results with, but I don't typically utilize it. No, not for any like, you know, moral or any reason like that. But um, I've had people use it to a good effect on what you might ask on I've, I've seen people use it on spider mites effectively um i've seen it's all about in my opinion how you apply it and applying it aggressively um a lot of the not very noxious pesticides and biopesticides and and things like this various like poisons but poisons to a certain degree are um you know, they're maybe less toxic to mammals and they're maybe even a little, a lot less toxic to like insects. But if you use it more at a greater concentration or if you use it more frequently, then you're going to have a better effect, especially if it's a contact killer. Um, so it has to make contact with the pest in order to be effective. Um, it also might make contact with biocontrol agents and have lethal effects or it might have sublethal effects. So compounds can have effects where, um, like for example, a predatory mite might not die, uh, but it might abort its egg. So um, if you're relying on a biocontrol agent to reproduce faster than the pest prey, or rather the prey population, then if you spray a, com a chemical that like dissuades them from searching, or they have to like stop and like clean themselves of, or it, it stresses them out and it causes them to abort their um, eggs, then that can have a cumulative effect that is negative in the long term. For example, not that yeah. I'm saying Dr. Zymes is like that, but contact uh, pesticides are. Um, you have to make contact. And some things produce shelters like various caterpillars do. And some things hide away. A lot of things eat at, on the uh, underside of leaves to stay away from the UV radiation of sunlight, which is damaging, and also from uh, rain and other kinds of things. All right, let me find my list of questions that I grabbed. Uh... Oh, so... shout out to, shout out to um, in the chat, uh, Roy Rodriguez is asking about uh, springtails, and I have a video about them, Roy, and they're not usually a bad problem, not typically, almost never. Uh, so Devin Rash a while ago said, how much is beneficial insect scat a concern for failing for microbials, specifically coliforms? Good question. I don't know any examples personally. And the well, reason reason for that, but that's, you know, that's not necessarily, that could be a sample size. I, no, even, I, well, I was going to say, I'm, I'm talking to uh, Alec Dixon who runs SC Labs next week. So if I can, or if the audience can be my memory for me, remind me to ask him what labs are seeing with insect uh, poo. Yeah, definitely ask because, um, most arthropod uh, frass or, or exudate or excretion or poo is um, a lot of times it's liquid and a lot of times it's evaporative. Um, and in the case of insects, a lot of insects will, they'll produce um, like a volatile waste product that like comes out of so, this. So, so I should not visualize my own deuces as what a uh, bug's poo looks like. For mammals, uh, if it's liquid frass, it's a big problem usually. <laughs> Got it. <laughs> but uh, yeah, so, and some insects will excrete waste uh, through their skin, essentially through their exoskeleton, their integument. Um, and that volatizes away too, sort of like they're analog to like urine. 
I like that Jack Greenstock is holding down the fort in the chat. Jack, I appreciate it. <laughs> Just Jack, answering everyone's questions. <laughs> Jack, is a, Jack is solid. Jack is good about that. And if you want to see more of him, you can see him on his Jack Greenstock podcast. And you can see him on the Cheap Home Grow podcast, <laughs> growing with your fellow, grow, growing with my. Could, we could even bring him on right now. We could even bring him on right now. What a great idea. Let's. Uh, all right. Well, while we're talking, I'll uh, shoot him. Uh, so just quickly, uh, so oh, well, Rumboy Rum 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 asked, uh, about broad mites, but yeah, hit whatever you're going to hit. And then, uh, run boy asked about broad mites. Yeah. So just on the frass thing, um, I'd be interested to know because a lot of frass, especially from smaller, like mites and things is, um, evaporative and liquid and doesn't stay a long time and is mostly nitrogenous waste. Um, from what I understand, unless they are infected with a pathogen or something, uh, some persimilis, which are infected with um, uh, some pathogens that cause not what's called non-responding syndrome, uh, which flatten their bodies and make them exude like crystals, um, sort of like protein, I think, crystals or something like this, uh, instead of their normal waste. And that's another example of how they're um, infected. And that's how you can tell if you're like, you know, if you're using a microscope and you're and analyzing them and that kind of a thing. Uh, but most frass is either liquid or solid. Uh, caterpillars and other things can cause big problems when they uh, produce frass and they bore into a, um, you know, into a bud. And then the frass uh, either carries or is some sort of vector for uh, fungus. And then that fungus, uh, you know, spreads from the frass to the plant material. And then you ruin the entire bud. And that would probably be an example of contamination for sure. So it definitely depends on what kind of pest it is, just like everything else in this conversation, seemingly. And then what's the question about broad mites? Jess, can you, I think it was, uh, can you talk about them? We've been, he was like, you've been, I know the title of the conversation is uh, aphids, but can you touch on broad mites? Yeah, at this point, it's sort of uh, turned into a presentation about IPM, which is totally fine with me. I love talking about this stuff. Um, so it's like, we have a presentation and like every 10 minutes we'll like meander off for half an hour on some topic and then we'll come back so we can get it. it how, how much more of your aphid presentation do you have? Not a whole lot more, just, okay. some, just some so, information on biocontrols and we can. Yeah. yeah. So, so, all right, so, so let's jump into that. Cause I mean, I, 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 I have a little text edit thing with all the questions so i will not forget them so let, let's go back to let's the home stretch of the presentation then we'll get to some questions absolutely so i just want to i'll just reiterate here basically in short form here's what i want you to know about the cannabis aphid um so documented 1860 in italy it's in a bunch of states in the u.s it's in several places in europe um, ostensibly, since cannabis is from the Eurasian continent, uh, cannabis aphids native territory is probably the Eurasian continent as well, wherever cannabis uh, spread to, or at least its origin point potentially, which is thought to be central uh, and central eastern, what is now China, uh, around the Tibetan plateau, um, in the Qinghai Lake area, that kind of place. Uh, but of course, over time, we might find that this is not the case, or that there's um, you know, some other factors that we find out in uh, historical context. Uh, so it's colonized a bunch of places around the world where cannabis is produced. Um, it isn't lethal to cannabis plants, but it can cause a lot of problems for cannabis cultivation. Um, we don't know whether or not cannabis aphids are vectors for various pathogens um, and to what extent. The cannabis virome isn't understood, and that's all the viruses that are associated with cannabis. And the virome of the cannabis aphid is not well known either, nor, are we, nor do we know about its microbiome very well. So it's very understudied and we will have more research in the future. But um, they have two kind of important things about them. One is that they have telescoping generations. They are born pregnant and they live birth clonal offspring. They don't typically do a lot of sexual reproduction, but it is possible. Um, they don't need it. They reproduce very rapidly. And so very easily you can have one female producing like, you know, uh, dozens of females across like a two week, week period, um, depending on your temperature and that sort of a thing. 
Uh, they're also holocyclic. They produce eggs to um, overwinter, as opposed to other aphids that will um, overwinter as adults. So when it gets to be like late summer, autumn kind of environment, then you might find aphids that will be flying and you might find them pr uh, producing eggs on your cannabis plants. So be watching out for that, especially in outdoor environment. In indoor environments, this might not happen as much, but I can see a situation where that could occur, especially if they're coming in from the outside inside. Um, because we don't know very much about it, the hop aphid uh, is a good thing to extrapolate from. I've already talked about it before. They can move between uh, like 15 to 150 kilometers, depending on various things like the atmospheric pressure and uh, whether or not they have other incidental hosts they can get into and, and help them kind of spread and that sort of a thing. There are several chemical compounds produced by hops that might also be produced in cannabis, especially like alpha and beta pinene um, and possibly germacrine D uh, that can be either an antifeedant or some sort of repellent effect on the cannabis aphid like it does for the hop aphid, but we don't really know enough about it. And for biocontrols, um, there are several. I like to use Bouveria bassiana, which is a fungus that will colonize the insect body and kill it. You can also use various chemical compounds um, as direct in pyrethrin will be effective against them, but various places will have various restrictions on using them in either various, um, you know, aspects of cannabis production, like flowering versus vegetation, or they just flat out won't let you use it commercially or maybe even residentially, just, you know, just considering the international aspect of YouTube, somebody hearing this advice should be aware of that. Um, and I think people. we have a uh, Zolbard urine, South Africa, correct? Wait from the type pack. All right, keep going. Zolbard makes a good point here. Uh, 2020 should be teaching people a lot right. of quarantine. No, it, it, how many uh, operations just have horrible, like I got some clones from my friend and like I put them next to all the moms. <laughs> too often, too often. And, uh, you know, that's a, probably the most major vector is people when it comes to any agricultural pest, but especially cannabis aphid and one of the keys will be us as an industry together, um, you know, just not doing those practices. But, you know, it's, it's tough sometimes, I, I understand. <laughs> um, so there are parasitoid wasps that will uh, parasitize cannabis aphid. Uh, several aphidia species will parasitize. Uh, aphidia metricariae is found is known in like Punjab, so in like the Kashmir Valley area, kind of near Pakistan and India. Um, and, and, and just quickly, because I have not figured out how to spotlight my video when it's just the two of us, I have to talk so people can see what I'm showing. So this is the parasitic wasp uh, exploding out of the aphid's body. That's right. So what you're seeing, what you were seeing was an aphid, what's called a mummy, which is when the aphid sort of becomes this hardened shell that the larva that then pupates into and then the larva will eclose from the husk and become an adult and that's how that happens and so there's aphidius metricarii there's aphidius colomani that's commercially available um, there are lady beetles of all kinds like the convergent lady beetle um, i mentioned a bunch of other lady beetles that might uh, that feed on the hop aphid and probably are also suitable for the cannabis aphid as well um, in my YouTube video about this. Uh, green lace wings, brown lace wings, soldier beetles, um, whirly gig mites, um, big eyed bugs, minute pirate bugs, uh, hoverfly larvae. Yeah, that's a pretty big, that's a good group of insects that you can sort of cultivate. Some, place will have, some places will have all of these, some places will have none of these or only very few of these, and some you will have to attract to your local area over time. Uh, some of them are commercially available even. So that's my, that's my recap in a much smaller time. Now we can go to questions. 
All right. I uh, what was I what was I reading on the chat? Uh, anyone been studying up? So Zulbard, anyone been studying up on fungus eating insects and how effective are they on controlling fungus on plants? Yes, an entomologist named Andrew Th Sutherland, who I'm a big fan of. Uh, he worked, I think, for his dissertation. He uh, produced a paper about um, Silobora, Vigimin, Viginitimaculata, the 22 spotted ladybug, lady beetle, right? And um, it, it feeds on fungus. It feeds on powdery mildew in particular. And he believes that there's an untapped potential for using Silobora um, to affect powdery mildew um, populations. Possibly. Wait, just just quickly, Silobora are uh, typical ladybugs, or some, or a different type of ladybug. Well, what do you mean by typical? Like the red one with the black dots that we've all seen a million of. No, uh, importantly, they are a lot smaller, and they have like a white and black coloration. I'll get a picture. I got it. They're part of a tribe called, or there's 20 spotted, not the 22 spotted, my mistake. But yeah, Viginta maculata, Silobora Viginta maculata. Um, so that's 22 in Latin, in case you're curious. That's where the name comes from. And I have a video on them and other lady beetles in the tribe, Halizeani, which are, uh, which are fungivorous. They feed on uh, fungi. And it's actually a very derived trait. So... Um, most lady beetles are predators, but a very, very recent group of lady beetles, and as far as we know, it's really only evolved like once, or maybe even twice, uh, and possibly in separate populations, where they move from eating uh, certain kinds of prey, or pollen possibly even, to feeding on fungi. And Silobora is a genus that uh, encompasses several species, like the 20 spy lady beetle that feed on powdery mildew. And I, I think that without, like, I think if they're used strategically, I think that there's a possibility as well. And Andrew Sutherland's very passionate about this. And I'd love to see him be able to work more about on it. But currently, they're not commercially available or anything like that to um, affect powdery mildew. And I think that an incidental population might not be very effective. But both the larvae and the adults feed on powdery mildew. Got it. Um, let me go back to hold on. Well, hold on. let me go to what the current questions are. I was looking at uh past pression or questions. Um, so People were talking about tannins a while ago. Uh, does cannabis contain tannins? Uh, so that was Zolbard a while ago, like trees. I don't know uh, off the top of my head. They might produce some. I think that um, like grape, grape leaves produce tannins, for example. That's why you put them in pickles, rather in pickle jars, so that they can... Um, uh, make the pickles have a crunch, for example. So they have that effect on the on the cucumbers that are pickling. Um, so I think a lot of a lot of plants might produce some level of tannins, but I don't know if it's a, a, an extreme amount, like an oak, for example. Yeah, d does uh, tobacco with nicotine? The nicotine is like a pest. Uh, it's like to fight pest, right? That's true. So um, nicotine is in the nicotinoid group of chemicals, like neonicotinoids are. And neonicotinoids are, uh, those are produced by humans. Those are synth synthetic nicotinoids. Um, but there are nicotinoids in nature as well. That's where they got the idea. And um, nicotine, for example, is, it affects our neurology. 
it affects the it's it affects the neurology of mammals and it also affects the neurology of insects our physiologies are similar enough um, both of us being animals that um, on a very simplified level uh, and a much more greater effect um, it's much more toxic to insects and arthropods than it is to uh, humans and other mammals and that kind of a thing so just quickly, Devin Rash, uh, who has confirmed being an analytical chemist, says cannabis does contain uh, tannins, but not a lot like as in trees. It's great when you say something like that and you're actually right off the top of your head. <laughs> well, I'm glad to hear that. I, I'm, I'm so happy that people in the chat can bring this wonderful insight um, it's one of my favorite things about social media. And yeah, although, although I'm not fact checking much of this. <laughs> this is an important thing to, co- to also like mention, someone in the chat confirmed it's someone true. who isn't me. <laughs> yeah, well, I appreciate that nonetheless. Um, I would be surprised if that were the case, though. I think that's a pretty. I think a lot of tannin production is conserved amongst a lot of um, uh, plant groups. There's a lot of that kind of a thing with the plant immune response. Yeah, Jack said cannabis is heavier in terpenes, esters, aldehydes, and ketones. Uh, Marshall Artist 2012 said, I'm also interested in any facts and treatment strategies for broad mites. Got them indoors last year. Plants were weak, battled for months. Went plant-free six months. Mites are still in my house. Nice. <laughs> So important to note is to know that whether or not you're actually dealing with broad mites, and I'm not trying to insult anyone's intelligence when I say that, but a lot of people don't, a lot of people that I've had ask me about ideas were afraid that they were dealing with a broad mite when they were really dealing with a mold mite, what I call a mold mite, uh, mites that are kind of in the tyrophagus genus or um, their relatives, which are often feeder mites in biocontrol sachets, for example. So they're used as fodder for the predatory mites. So they feed on bran or the fungus in the bran. The predatory mites feed on the mold mites and then they reproduce um, very, very profusely and then they enter out of the sachet and that's how that works. So it's possible, especially it, it, it sucks. I'm just thinking how much it sucks to be on the bottom of the insect food chain. Yeah. Right. <laughs> like your, your death is like I'm speared and my innards are sucked out. If you've ever seen how a, uh, a wind scorpion or a sun spider eats, um, which are a type of like arachnid, a solifugid, they have these uh, masticating pincers. They don't use venom um, and they just like mash and it's very like visceral <laughs> and it's like, wow, that would be such a terrible, like, uh, like horror creature from a film. Like that. And would do be... they, do they at least eat head first or do they eat like feet oh, first? Just, whatever, whatever limb or trunk of the body that they happen to make contact with. They're very aggressive a lot of the time too. Um, they're pretty fascinating to see. Um, but yeah. Um, so Devin, a while ago, you had a question about terpene production. Oh, I didn't answer the broad mite question. I realized. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Sorry. (laughs) Sorry about that. So you might be, especially if you can see them with your naked eye, you might be dealing with a different kind of mite. Maybe it's a predatory mite. Maybe it's some sort of soil mite. Maybe it's a mold mite. But broad mites are incredibly small. And I have video on my YouTube channel, observational footage of Tarsinemid mites, which are the broad mite group, Tarsinemidae. And I have videos that go over the Areophyidae, the rest of mites, the Tarsinemidae, the broad mites, and the, um, what was the other one? There were three major groups. I even forgot myself. Oh, Tetranicidae, the spider mites, right? The three big pest mite families. And I talk about what they look like. And broad mites are very, 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 very small. And they're typically, most actual tarsinemids are actually not even pests. But this particular species, um, what people are really referring to is polyphago tarsinemus latus. Polyphago, poly, polyphago means eats a lot. Uh, 
um, and Tarsinemus is the the thread foot that they have. Now, did you song. did did you take Latin like in seventh through twelfth grade or something? No, not in high school, but in college. But yeah, um, I've I've been a big Latin fan, and um, yeah. So I, but you know, I the thing is, is that I go between pronunciations. Since you brought it up, A E is E. And I, I, depending on who you talk to, if you're a lawyer or a doctor, you might say Swirsky I, like I often do. But in, uh, I think it's classical Latin or, um, yeah. And, and so you might have religious Latin. Ecle so the E, G, N, C. What? The E, G, N, C, A, E. Like the Mediterranean Ocean. E, G, N, C. No, no, A E G E A N. How would you pronounce that? Uh, Mediterranean, I think. Medi probably Mediterranean. It depends. No, no, on no, 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 no. <laughs> <laughs> let Let me put it in the chat. Yeah, what? Are, yeah, I couldn't understand what you were saying. Do Do you see that? Oh, I see. The E G N. The uh, right because no. you said A E, uh, you'd pronounce uh, E, e anyway. E G yeah, E G N, E G N. I think. So another problem is that uh, some things look like they're Latin based, but they might be Greek based. And if you want it to be uh, sort of uh, truthful to that pronunciation, you might pronounce it a different way too. But I think it's the E G N C. But that might just be an anglicized version of a different word, um, if that makes sense. You really put me on the hot seat for that. Yeah, we're we're uh, that's okay. We we've meandered off topic. Uh, <laughs> what what was the question we were answering? Were we still talking about broad mites? Broad mites. So essentially, broad mites are very small. So make sure that you are actually looking at broad mites. If you went plant free, um, you know broad mites can't survive without their food, and they reproduce very quickly. And so. I would be surprised if you got the same broad mites unless they're reinfesting from a different plant. Polyphago tarsinemus, right? So eats a lot of plants. <laughs> eats a lot of plants. That that's literally what its name means. Eats a lot of things, really. Right. Polyphago. Lots of eating. Or lots of eat. You know. So it eats a lot of different plants and it's true to its name. And it's got an adaptive ability to do that. Um, whereas other tarsinemidae do not. So it's kind of unique in that way. And um, there, I have observational footage that you can sort of compare to on my YouTube channel. They kind of look like very, they're very small. But they kind of have like a football shape, kind of like a, a pointed end on, on one side and a pointed end on another side. And sometimes you'll see this behavior where the broad mites will, uh, they'll carry. So when the female, when the adolescent females pupate or they go through what's called calypso, calypso stacy calypso, <laughs> calypto stacy yeah and uh, it's when they're kind of inside the pupa and they can still move around but it's kind of like they're they're uh they're kind of still in like a slumber or they're kind of still in a protective um environment inside the shell so the males will They'll, they'll detect it through some sort of scent recognition and then they'll pick them up and then they'll travel with them and then they'll guard them from other males and then they'll mate with them on eclosion and then produce more broad mites. So sometimes if you see them, if you have a microscope and you can see it in the footage too, you can see them pick up the females and move them. And so you'll see like one holding another one. That's pretty uh, standard broad mite um, behavior. So that's another thing you can use to kind of confirm for yourself. Uh, but to deal with them, um, sulfur is very mitocidal. If you can do that and you're not in flower, a wettable sulfur agent would be useful against them. Uh, predatory mites, I have a video on uh, predatory biocontrols for uh, broad mites and rest of mites, both. Um, and Amblyseia swirsky and uh, Neocilius cucumeris are both type 3E or type 3 predatory mites, and they go after russet mites. They've been used against tomato russet mites as well, and I've seen them work on citrus uh, bud mite, 
which is also a russet mite. And um, ostensibly, they could also work on aloe mite, I would think, as well. But I haven't seen that yet. I'm uh, looking at questions. Uh, Shredder911, a long time ago, asked, do hop aphids go for humulene? That would be kind of um, neat, right? I don't, I don't know personally. It's a very honest answer. Uh, yeah, what was that, Devin? What was your question? So I wonder how. All right, let me go back to Devin's. So. Terpene production with foliar applications. How does foliar applications uh, of precursors like olivetolic acid or even eliciter like salicylic acid or methyl jasminate affect terpene production? And then Jack said, uh, Devin, I wouldn't go about it that way. Well, maybe that was... All right. Anyway, I don't know if any of this is making sense, but yeah, it makes sense. So for those who don't know, olivetolic acid is the, uh, I would call it like, I think there's a more precise chemical name, chemistry name, but um, it's like the, like the crox, like the most basal precursor. And I don't remember the process in its entirety, but olivetolic acid is part of that. And it's true, the salicylic acid can have an eliciting response on the immune system of plants in fact, that is how you induce an immune response in a lot of plants, and one of many ways, um, as we talked. So that can have an effect on terpene production, absolutely. Not I mean, both in addition, the physical structures themselves, the actual trichomes, and also the production of the secondary metabolites. Important to note, um, secondary metabolites, they get that name for a reason. Primary metabolites are very necessary for uh, healthy functioning in a plant. Although the boundary between uh, you know, primary and secondary can be a little bit fuzzy, but essentially secondary metabolites are like not uh, inherently necessary for the plant to like, like exist, if that makes sense. And so- that, that, That's kind of how scientists have classified uh, the metabolites. At least in that context, yeah. Um, there are other ways you can classify them, like what kind of chemicals they are and that kind of thing. Um, if they are, you know, what, there are other metabolites besides chemicals, like uh, proteins and that sort of a thing. But um, so secondary metabolites take a lot of energy, essentially, for the plant to produce. And so having an eliciter is very important because that will make the immune system respond in that favorable way, favorable for the cultivator that is. But it does, in a way, you can kind of call it a developmental stress because you are el eliciting a particular immune response, which is kind of like a stress reaction, if you can you know, kind of conceptualize it that way. Um, and a lot of times plants are dealing with all kinds of stressors, even if it's not uh, sort of overtly visual to us, if that makes sense too. Um, like, for example, some insect pests cause chlorosis in the leaves when they feed, um, and other ones just don't, and they can be totally cryptic. So, you know, um, but to answer the question, uh, applying olivetolic acid or other sorts of precursors, to my knowledge, doesn't necessarily result in, like, increased uh, cannabinoid production. And the reason for that is because I don't think that the plant physiology can make use of the olivetolic acid in that state sort of um you know through osmosis or through absorption of the of the compound um if somebody has an alternative view i'd be very curious to know it but i think that the sort of like there's a there's like a very complex um phytochemical machinery that's going on in the plant physiology and like it might be influenced by various external compounds, but I think they have to produce those compounds in a particular way and transport them in a certain way. And if that's disrupted in some fashion, or if it's, or if something isn't there, it's somewhere else in the plant, then it might not have any effect or might have a local effect only. 
I'd really have to like read about it or something. So uh, since we distinguish between primary and secondary metabolites, can you also talk about biotic and abiotic stress? Absolutely. What's so, the difference? Right. What, what is each one and what's the difference? Biotic stress is stress from a biological source and abiotic stress is stress from an abiological source, a non-biological source. And uh, they work so together. Can, can, can you give some examples of each one? Like Absolutely. what's a biological source of stress? Biological source of stress would be any sort of pest, um, a fungal pathogen, an herbivorous insect or arthropod. Um, it could be a parasitic plant that's wrapped around the plant uh, or its host plant and is like um, siphoning off nutrients and that sort of a thing. Um, those are all biotic stressors, for example. Abiotic stressors would be things like heat, light, or well, rather temperature, whether it's hot or cold, light, humidity. Um, so your psychrometrics. Um, you know, uh, like soil uh, hydration, for example, availability of various nutrients, for example. But, you know, at a certain point, uh, sort of biology and abiology does meet at a nexus point, and you can have abiotic stressors affect biotic stressors, and then those biotics, or you know what I mean? So like with the wilting comment, with like plants that are wilting, an abiotic stress might be a combination of things. It might be light intensity, UV radiation, temperature, um, and a lack of hydration. That's a bunch of abiotic factors all in one. Um, not all abiotic stressors are causes unto themselves, but if that makes sense. So really just describing the stressor, not necessarily the cause because sunlight and heat can cause the lack of hydration, but we're really just talking about the lack of hydration as in and of itself. And then that can cause a response in the plant. And then that can affect a biotic stressor like an insect. And so an insect that might be used to dealing with this more often, because maybe it's adapted to a desert climate or it's adapted to plants that aren't super adapted to a dry or desert condition, it might do very much better. Or it might be counting on the plant to actually be doing really well. And if it doesn't, then it might actually have problems itself, kind of ironically. So Paul Brown, who may or may not still be on, because <laughs> this was like two hours ago, asked, uh, are nematodes, can, can you talk about nematodes and kind of their role in controlling, I mean, are they relevant to aphids or, or not at all? Nematodes are a pretty big, large group of organisms, the nematoda, and there are predatory nematodes, there are parasitic nematodes, there are uh, herbivorous nematodes. A lot of people know about the um, rot newt nematodes, or rot newt, huh, the root knot nematodes. Um, they're a huge destructive pest in various agricultural crops. Um, I don't I don't know if they actually go after cannabis as well, but I wouldn't be surprised. They're huge generalists. But as for the, the ones that we've used in biocontrol, um, they're not super relevant to aphids, no. I've seen people use Steenernema species against thrips, and I've seen people use Heterohabditis bacteriophora HB on um, various insects as well. Uh, but they work much better in the soil. Sometimes people apply them foliarly, but I think that has limited potential in my experience at least. Uh, there might be conditions that are much more conducive to it. Um, a big part of using nematodes in a foliar application, for example, is to not let the foliar application dry out or be exposed to a lot of sunlight. So it kind of makes it difficult to use in the outdoors unless you apply at night maybe. Um, or if you like close the shutters in a greenhouse or block out the light some other way. Um, so Nematodes are used for fungus gnat larvae a lot in cannabis culture. Um, I have a video on fungus gnats too. Nematodes are good for them. Nematodes work really good on larger 
uh, targets like beetle grubs, for example. They're very, very useful for them because the nematodes get into the larvae. Um, they either bore their way in or they find a way through in various orifices like the mouth or the spiracles I talked about, which are holes alongside their sides of insects or, the, or through the anus. And so they go through any of those or all of those uh, orifices and then they, uh, they produce these bacteria and these bacteria would actually kill the, the, the target, not the nematode, not, not primarily. And then the nematodes- Once will... again, I just like to confirm I'm, I'm not a uh, small bug on the food chain with <laughs> nematodes coming in through my anus and, <laughs> and killing me from the inside. Yeah, I think you should really reiterate that point. It's, it sucks to be a bug. Um, everything's out to get you. Or parasitic wasps, like putting their babies inside me and letting them eat me alive. Yeah, uh, I'm glad we evolved past that. So Armchair Warrior asked, are leafhoppers actual pests or are they just hanging out? Leafhoppers are pests. Um, they can often be like incidental pests. But one important thing to know about the hemiptera that I've already mentioned, but I'll repeat, is that they they are very important as an insect group and order because they often transmit pathogens. Aphids transmit pathogens, leaf hoppers, plant hoppers, frog hoppers, um, all of the hoppers, uh, mealybugs, soft scale, armored scale insects. Dennis. Uh, huh? Dennis. Dennis. Oh, Matthew, you're aging yourself. You're just a baby. I'm joking. <laughs> uh, I, I did not get the joke, but I'm curious to know the reference. <laughs> he, he's an actor. You just he's said Dennis, a, though. Yeah, Dennis Hopper. Oh, uh, <laughs> okay. Well, I wasn't in the right mindset. I see. Um, I wasn't realizing you meant Dennis Hopper. Very, very, um, very smooth there. A great uh, American thespian. Definitely. Um, so these hemiptera, they, they transmit viruses. Um, they transmit bacteria. They transmit sometimes fungi. So, or at least they create wounds that allow fungi to get in, in some cases. Big thing about cannabis. Recently, it was confirmed that as far back as like maybe even 2015, but possibly 2017, beet curly top virus was confirmed in cannabis. And this was in Colorado. Beet curly top virus is a very pernicious virus. It's found in a lot of parts of the world. The USA is one of them. Uh, Africa, the Middle Eastern Peninsula, or um, not Peninsula, but the Middle East um, and Europe even and also Africa. So it hits beets a lot, but it also infects a ton of other different kinds of plants. And it's vectored by Circulus tenalis, or Circulifer tenalis, the beet leafhopper. And although there are other beet leafhoppers in that genus, Circulifer, this uh, is the primary species that causes that viral uh, transmission. And what's important to note is that while, where, whereas a lot of leafhoppers will just incidentally feed on a plant uh, and then kind of not have any problem, you don't necessarily know whether a leafhopper will have a virus or a pathogen in it. And as cannabis culture becomes more um, productive and uh, you know much more prolific in the U.S. and other parts of the world, we might see a greater propensity of leafhoppers for uh, taking up pathogens and putting them into cannabis plants that never had those interactions before. Or if they did, they weren't documented. And so I would be very cautious about all organisms that you don't know, but that leafhoppers in particular, especially the beet leafhopper, which is common in the Midwest, um, you know, it could transmit beet curly top virus, which is lethal and you can't really cure it. Most viruses, most plant viruses can't really be cured uh, without like thermotherapy and plant tissue culturing and that kind of a thing. And that's very expensive and it's non-conventional. It's usually not worth it. 
and sometimes even uh, various hemiptera, aphids, leafhoppers, other sorts of things, they can take up a virus from a plant that's totally asymptomatic out in the environment. Um, and then they come down from wherever they are into a cultivation space when the seasons change or whatever. And then they uh, infect the plants. And you wouldn't have even known that there was an asymptomatic plant like right outside your field. And that's the kicker. So from a canicultural perspective, you know, be, be careful. There are a lot of sucking plant bugs that can vector pathogens. And we're just scraping the surface. So Maddie Bucks asked, is there any beneficial that hunts the caterpillars that eat the stems on my buds or is BT the best for them? Unfortunately, even BT, Bacillus thuringiensis, isn't the best way to go about it because it's also kind of a contact, not a contact kill, but it has to, the organism has to feed on the tissue that gets the bacillus on the surface. So if the caterpillars, and oftentimes those caterpillars like hemp borer, and um, tobacco budworm I've seen, and a few other borer um, caterpillars, they, like I was saying earlier, they produce shelter or they bore into shelter. And um, the bacillus product that you apply won't affect anything because you're only hitting the surface. And if they've already bored into the stem, then it doesn't penetrate. And so your coverage doesn't matter in that case, unfortunately. Um, as for parasitoids, there's a ton of parasitoid wasps that go after caterpillars, but I don't know any specifically, especially commercially available, that would be able to affect the caterpillars boring your cannabis plants. Although that might be a um, biocontrol effort in the future. Got it. All right. Uh... Let me see if there are any last burning questions, but uh, I got to start prepping dinner for small humans. I totally understand. I really appreciated <laughs> the, um, hey, that's life, man. <laughs> I appreciate that you One day you'll have kids and you'll, you'll, you'll understand. Ain't that the truth? Um, I uh, really appreciate you having me on in the first place. And I look forward to... Um, many more in the future no problem so all right so we're we're doing i think sometime next saturday with uh russell and then uh devin is going to present uh from we're going to pull him out of the audience and onto the stage uh his research um and then so monday morning do, do you know who linda chalker scott is not readily. Maybe I've met or linked in that person. <laughs> Possibly. Uh, she she's at a uh, Washington State. So anyway, she she's coming on Monday morning. Um, let me. She has all these. Uh, yeah, I just put a link in the YouTube chat. But uh, and then Tuesday is a full day of verma compost uh, with a whole bunch of academic researchers from Cornell and NC State and University of Hawaii, uh, commercial producers of uh, vermicompost at scale, and then uh, farmers. So kind of the different parts of the vermicompost ecosystem all talking to each other. Um, and there's stuff later in the week, but I'm blanking on it. So anyway, with that, we will uh, kill the live stream and thank you everyone for watching and Matthew, I will see you next weekend. I heartily look forward to it. Thank you. <laughs> All right. See you everyone.